uh, welcome you all to the work session of the Salt Lake City Council for June 11th, 2019. Uh, we have... Some people. Yeah, so we still, so James will be joining us uh, shortly. Um, council members, on your agenda, uh, there is a uh, written briefing, uh, which is a response from T-Mobile. Do any of you have uh, any comments or, or questions about that? <coughs> um, Council Member Johnston. I said I wasn't Mr. Chair, and I apologize. That's okay. I lied to you a moment ago. I, hey, I opened the door for you, so. Um, no, I appreciate the written response from T-Mobile. We've talked previously about this. Um, I am going to um, hold on to the written response in the future. Uh, the difficulty is it's a 10-year agreement, so um, I may not be around. Well, I'll be alive, I hope, but... Um, <laughs> To follow up on this, um, no, I, I just uh, it's it's one of those. This is one of those issues where we have to take it on faith to some extent. Um, I don't know that we're going to have the ability to monitor the city as close as we'd like. Uh, there's federal and state laws that really are pretty rigid about what we can and can't do. Um, so I appreciate the response. I hope they'll live up to it and other carriers as well. Um, so thank you. Great. Any other uh, comments? Okay, so the next item on our agenda is the fiscal year 2019-20 budget unresolved issues. Uh, so we went through uh, quite a few things and straw polled a lot of stuff on Thursday. Um, now that we've had a few days to uh, look at you know, some of those um, straw polls and decisions, there's also uh, some very good news that came last night, which is the new growth number uh, is much higher uh, than, uh, than we were originally proposing, which uh, allows the council to continue along the path um, that, that we charted out this year uh, to build a stronger, um, more vibrant city and a much more uh, efficient government. A lot of the straw poll decisions that, that, that we've made um, work along those lines. I, I see that the uh, mayor uh, released a press release uh, with some additional uh, recommendations um, for her basically changing some of the, her original recommended budget. Um, I'm grateful to see that the mayor now supports the council's um, push to hire more firefighters. Um, one of the things that, that we've talked about uh, with this is, you know, with, with this new growth is, is how, best to, uh, how best to do that, how best to shore up um, funding our future and, and some of those other things. And so um, it's great to see her finally uh, agree that we do need more uh, firefighters. So um, as we go through this budget, um, we'll talk about that. There is also another, another item that I think we'll, we'll want to talk about. The mayor uh, proposed uh, in her recommended budget a 50 cent uh, parking increase in her press release this afternoon. Uh, she changed, she uh, now recommends halving that. Um, that was an issue that we uh, straw polled last week. Um, it, was, it was actually our closest uh, straw poll. It, it was a 4-3. Um, that we uh, continue forward with the recommended, uh, the mayor's recommended fee increase. Um, and I think this, you know, opens the door for uh, some more discussion as to how best to, how best to deal with that. Um, so those are, are, are some of the items. Lehua uh, is uh, from our council staff is going to be shepherding us through this process. Um, so, or yeah, she's, well, she's lifting us. Uh, she's, she's lifting us through this process or shepherding us through this process. So, uh, so I'll turn the time over to uh, Jennifer Bruno um, to um, lead the discussion and, and Lehua will keep us on task. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go. So Lehua, will you maybe give it an intro? 
Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a couple of remaining items that we need council direction on in order to prepare the motion sheet and final ordinances for your adoption tonight. And so we're just going to lead you through um, a couple of those documents, including a review of the motion sheet and the ordinance and the RDA resolution. Um, the first place that we'd like to start that I think will filter into all of those um, other documents is a new, um, what we're calling the short track, <laughs> short tracking sheet. We have the long um, track, now we have the short track. Yeah. Um, and Jennifer will walk through that. That is basically looking at the new uh, growth in property tax revenue and um, also listing all of the items that council members have straw polled before and some other items that we wanted to bring to your attention and get your direction on. So if it's okay, I'll just turn that time. <clears throat> Thank you. And Jennifer will tell you, it's the one with green. The one with green on the side. On the side. And it's, mm -hmm. this number th it's labeled number three. We realized we realized we had you know lots of paper at your places, so we started a numbering system, but we didn't think about the order. So now it's number three with the green and the yellow. Um, the green is just there to signify things that um, are still points of discussion. Um, also, I'll just uh, ask for apologies in advance as we put this together in the middle of the day today while we were in meetings. Um, we used abbreviated terms, and so uh, any typos, just please uh, know that it's a draft. Um, but it was meant for discussion purposes. So this all started with uh, receiving news la late last night that we do have extra new growth um, with which to uh, fund the general fund budget. And so that caused us to need to rebalance the general fund budget. So all of the straw polls that you guys went through, you guys start a handful of items. Um, there were a few items that were raised since uh, last Thursday's discussion. So we've just put them all in here and they're organized by revenues and expenditures and one time and ongoing funds so that we can kind of keep track of of um, using one-time funds for one-time sources, using one-time sources for one-time needs to the extent possible. So. And Jennifer, to that point, um, that's uh, so with the with the <laughs> new growth numbers, I I you know want to state again how important it is that that we did receive um, those numbers uh, to be much higher uh, than anticipated. One of the things is we were balancing and, and staff, you know, to their credit, has done a phenomenal job of of tracking all of our uh, interest and, and ensuring that, you know, our, our objective of creating, you know, a more efficient Salt Lake City government um, can work. One of the things that we ended up having to do as we were straw polling is there were a number of items that were ongoing items that we um, didn't have any choice but to, uh, or, or to, to place one-time money with. This um, new growth allows us to fix that. It allows us to go back on some of those areas and fund <clears throat> ongoing needs with ongoing revenue. Um, you know, there still may be, you know, as we as we work through, there there may be, you know, some things that that we will still have to fund with with one-time money. What that means for those listening uh, at home, if you haven't followed a, a budget process before, um, you know, there are certain municipal needs that are ongoing. Salaries or or a good example, um, at things that you have your your recurring costs year after year. Uh, one time, you know, money is just that; it's one time. So typically, we like to use one time money for uh, projects, CIP construction projects um, that are truly just one time projects. Um, if there are additional ongoing needs that, that do have to be funded with one time, what that does is it creates um, it, the, the necessity for the council next year uh, to come back and address those, address those things. So it is, um, you know, even if there are uh, a, you know, some ongoing things, it just means that we will have to uh, address those next year. And, and I'll just point out um, one other orientation I didn't um, give to the table is that I filled out a number of these items uh, with numbers, and that was a, for discussion purposes only to figure out sort of what um, the new growth could essentially take. But um, the reason that Lehua has the spreadsheet up is that these can all be changed. So um, I filled out the yellow numbers. Those are items that the council has not yet straw polled, but um, just to get a, get a sense of um, where the discussion could go. Great. So uh, new growth, do you want to accept it? I guess is the first question. That's an easy one, right? That is, um, <laughs> we, will, we will straw poll this for a formality, but um, Pretty, yeah. um, thumbs up that we had uh, accept the 100 plus thousand dollars. Actually a million, growth. about a million. A million, yeah. a million, sorry. 
Yes. Okay. okay, and that is unanimous with uh, council members Johnston and Rogers uh, not here. Um, so maybe they are truly one person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No one knows. No one knows. Uh, the next item um, would be uh, in the revenue or sources category, but uh, would technically be booked in the expense category, is to capture uh, additional months of vacancy savings from the ADA uh, and or ADA and equity manager positions in the CAN administration. And I, I believe Councilmember Mendenhall may have more information on that, so I don't know if she wants to talk about it or... Please, Councilmember Mendenhall. So in an effort to keep uh, the Funding Our Future housing, uh, affordable housing dollars in that intended vein uh, quite distinctly, we worked over the weekend to try to identify some funds that were not from that pool. And um, the, my proposal is that we take the, it's a, I'm not looking at it, but I think it's $106,000 each for the ADA administrator and equity positions. We delay the hiring of those until March, which allows four months of funding, and we capture five months of funding from those two positions. That'll allow the next administration to decide, um, as these are shifts into CAN that were not previously located in CAN, that'll allow that administration to decide kind of where to house those. and. Um, still allow those positions to be created, but it'll capture about $92,000. And the proposal is that we split that 92 equally, so it's about 46,000 between the two HRC communities, and work with CAN to, um, who I think I, I has indicated in our discussions last week that they're already thinking about sort of the, um, an area of distribution the, how many uh, blocks surrounding those HRCs we should um, consider these grants for, and that the grants would be administered similar to or along the same standards, really, as the HUD Building Facade Improvement Program, just like Councilmember Valdemoro suggested, and that but that the funds would be available either to businesses or to residents in those areas. Did I miss anything there, Councilmember Valdemoro? And that, oh yes, I did miss something, which is that we put an intent with that money that we um, are able to analyze with CAN uh, how the funding is utilized in those areas and what the impact is so that we can decide going forward if we'd like to expand that kind of a program citywide or deploy it as other projects happen throughout the city um, in more of a measured way, but that we come back to the table. Great. Um, questions or comments to Council, Mem uh, Council Member Mendenhall's uh, straw poll reconsideration suggestion? Mr. Chair? Yes. <clears throat> um, I appreciate, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Aaron about this yesterday and appreciate um, the, the, the Council Members sort of working with me on the idea of how to make it perhaps citywide um, so that other areas that may be affected by things that the city does um, could take advantage of a program if it's, if, it's, um, if it's successful, if it works, if that's what is necessary. The one thing I would ask, and it's just more of, we, we talked about it in the chair, vice chair, chair meeting earlier, um, of putting that money in the one-time column instead of the ongoing column, so we can balance that out. And since it's sort of a, or try try to balance it out anyway. Um, so since it's sort of a pilot program, then we can come back next year and, and have that discussion of whether or not it worked, whether or not we want to expand it, whatever. So I would, I would propose, I, I'm supportive of it, I would just propose putting it in the one-time column. Council Member Mendenhall? I'm fine with that. Okay. And I'm just wondering on our on our sheet three that adjusts our revenue amount, right? Oh, you got this. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay. For and the thirty-five thousand that uh, Councilmember Johnston has been a champion of, uh, 
that is not part of this proposal? It's not part of this because um, it's our understanding based on the administration's um, comments at last week's meeting that they have found sources from the current year budget to um, make that funding available. Okay. And any, sorry, before any discussion? Council member, oh, Lehua. I was just going to point out that staff did draft some intent language consistent with what you have mentioned. And so if you want to provide edits, we'll slip that right into your motion sheet. <laughs> okay. Um, before, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll straw poll, you know, whether to move forward with Council Member Mendenhall's suggestion, and then we'll also straw poll uh, the legislative intent, just to be, to be clear. Council Member Valdemoros. I just wanted to thank staff um, from CAN and also my uh, peer council members for working, <clears throat> you know, collaboratively and very creatively <clears throat> on a common goal, which is um, help the constituents of um, District 4 and District 5 where these new HRCs are coming. So I'm excited to see <coughs> where it goes and work closely um, for, um, for the success of this project. So thank you, Jennifer McGrath, for working with us. Thank you, Councilmember Valdemoros. Councilmember Johnston, I know that, that um, you've had some thoughts on this as well. Uh, yeah, I, I was concerned about uh, only funding it for four months. Um, if it wasn't an ongoing um, piece, bless you. Um, it sort of made it inoperable in a lot of ways for the new administration. Um, at this point, if we're going to delay it for six months, it, it does make it up to the new administration to even, to even implement it whatsoever. Um, so I'm a little split about it. I, I love the idea of, uh, after seeing more information about the equity position, it makes a lot of sense to me, but as a pilot, because I'm not sure, sure the exact scope, uh, what it would entail. Um, so I'm still supportive of that position in some capacity. So um, I will support this because of the one-time need we have with the transition to the HRCs. Um, I will uh, endorse strongly for the new administration, whoever that is, um, to fund that equity position and uh, see what we can accomplish with it. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, so let's straw poll. Um, if, if we could go back to the um, screen. Chart so it would be adding 92,000 as a one time savings and 92,000 as a one time uh, expense. Is that clear? Thumbs up that we support that, thumbs down that we oppose it. Okay. And that straw poll passes unanimously. Uh, now, if you could bring up the intent language so that we can see that. Um, I won't read it because you can all read. Um, thumbs up that we support um, having that intent language in the budget. Thumbs down that we oppose it or any discussion. If there's no discussion, thumbs up or thumbs down. And that is unanimous. Great. Uh, Council Member Mendenhall. Do we need a straw poll to, uh, because I know that we moved the landlord insurance and the building more equitable city into the unappropriated holding account do we but we also had a intent to evaluate it for this program do we need to do anything to undo that piece of it i don't think we I, well oh. correct me if i'm wrong i don't think we do because it was just a straw poll and as long so. as it's not already written into right our legislative intent right for so we'll we'll make that change since okay. that that would seem to be consistent with where your discussion is now and we'll just make right. sure to yep. have Thanks. that the thank you for that clarification sheet. though council member mendenhall we'll get to it in the motion sheet so uh the next item is a proposal to reduce the uh, proposed 50 cent parking meter rate increase to 25 cents that would cut the revenue in half so it would be a uh, the revenue increase in half I should say um, and that so that would be a 393,000 ongoing reduction okay uh, council member Fowler yeah. first off first off and uh, you know I think it, I think it's important that we clarify what this is. This is not a reduction. This is a, um, instead of the mayor recommending a 50% increase, now the mayor is recommending a 25 cent increase uh, for that fee. Do we know why the decision to, uh, David, do you, I, I, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm, it's just 
if anybody has any information as to what where this decision came from. I mean, not necessarily opposed to it. I Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members, for the opportunity to um, address the question. So um, absolutely provide some clarification on, on the mayor's additional uh, recommendations. Um, so as you know, when, um, when the mayor put her budget recommendation together, we were working with different revenue numbers as we, we do every year. Um, and so the initial uh, recommendation of a 50 cent increase was based on the numbers we had then um, and the shortfall that we are experiencing uh, regarding uh, parking revenue, uh, which impacts uh, compliance. Um, and so when the new numbers came out, um, the mayor was just expressing her um, opinion, her recommendation that um, if the council were to, to choose that one thing that could be done with the extra revenue is to reduce uh, the parking fee um, from 50 cents uh, to 25 cents, just like the recommendation the mayor made that instead of using funding our future dollars for the firefighters, we could use the new general fund revenue dollars, the new growth dollars for the firefighters, which again, we did not have the funding for um, in the mayor's recommended budget. Um, uh, okay, and, and thank you for that clarification. I will say that this is, the, um, this is not standard practice to have the mayor recommend a budget and then continue making recommendations that um, change her initial recommendation. Um, that is once you submit a recommended budget, that is it. Um, so we appreciate uh, the feedback. Um, we were already moving in that direction anyway. Right. So this isn't anything great. So you know, I think it's important not to spin that more than you already are trying to, um, but the recommended budget was the recommended budget. Um, the rest of it is up to up to the council. So absolutely, we thank very you much that. respect that. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. Councilmember Mendenhall. I think it's uh, consistent with some of the conversation that we've been having over these, the increase and other increases. Um, and I think you're right, that once that budget sailed out of that end of the hall, it's squarely in this end of the hall. But um, anyway, I think this new revenue is an exciting opportunity for us to look at lessening the impact on residents and people who come into the city in some ways. Uh, Councilmember Valdemoros. I just have questions for staff. Maybe when um, this is the first in parking rate increase we have since the installation of the. There may have been one increase right after that, but I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head. It has been a number of years. It, it's yeah. been a number of years. It's number of years. It's been, it's been <clears throat> increased one time, I think. Just yeah. one time. And another question is, um, what? What were the, the goals with this increase? Where will these funds go to? I don't remember right now. Um, the way that the administration described it, and I think David Levesque kind of just described it, also was to kind of compensate, help the administration, help the city compensate for some um, revenue shortfalls experienced in okay. parking revenue collections. Is that right? Is that yeah, fair? so um, we were uh, and have been experiencing a reduction. Is despite our best efforts to be very conservative in forecasting on parking uh, revenue, we haven't been experiencing some reductions. And it's kind of a somewhat of a vicious cycle in terms of the ability to support compliance and um, in the um, worry that then individuals stop paying for the meters because there's not the compliance to kind of hold individuals accountable. And so because it had been many years since there was uh, an increase in the, in the rate, that is where the recommendation came from. And this increase will not increase the, the, the enforcement staff or it's just going to remain as is? Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so questions about the um, recommendation to increase the parking rate 25 cents instead of uh, the original 50 cents. Okay, Councilmember Mendenhall. I think we should um, hold it and go through the other 
priorities that we looked at as a okay. council, and then we can come back and look Great. at that. Okay. Does that work with everybody? Uh, okay, sure. Council right. Member Johnston. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would, I would agree, but I am in support of that decrease at this point, um, pending further discussion, though. Okay. So right. we'll, for so the we'll purposes of the discussion, we'll maybe back it out of the spreadsheet, and then we'll see where the balancing is. Is that what I'm hearing? We'll see where the balancing is as you guys are going through the I, list. I don't even think, I don't know if I'd back it out. I'd oh, oh, okay. Just, just highlight it? Yeah, just okay. highlight it, and then we'll, you know, before we... So what we'll do, and, and let me just make sure I'm understanding your intent, Councilmember Mendenhall. Um, we'll go through this sheet right here, and as soon as we get through the other items, we'll come back um, to that one at the end. Okay. Okay. So then the next item um, that was, <coughs> excuse me, previously discussed by the council, but um, flagged for um, future discussion if there were additional funds was to reinstate the training and travel, sorry for the typo there, <laughs> budget um, in economic development. There was a proposed $11,000 reduction. We're assuming it's an ongoing need, so we've listed it in the ongoing column, but you could fund it in the one-time column if you didn't have any other way. <coughs> so... Comments about this one, Council Member Mendenhall. When we met with economic development and asked um, how impactful training is in terms of recruitment for new businesses coming in, um, it seemed to be quite important and a really strong tool. This is a small, relatively small amount of money for, I think, the benefit that our economic development department is able to gain, so I'm supportive of this. Okay. Okay, any other discussion on this? Okay. I'll pull it down. Um, yeah, thumbs up that you support that, thumbs down that you oppose. That is unanimous. Okay. Then the next item was a, a general idea um, raised by um, two council members to add uh, staff to the, like one FTE to the economic development department. There were um, slightly different ideas for that. And so one idea is to grant the FTE at a certain level that gives the department flexibility to decide either how to split it into two or um, deploy the resource in another way. Mr. Chair. Council Member Fowler. I think that Anna and I were the two that kind of brought this up. And I think we, we did kind of have an some different ideas of where that could go, but in talking with staff today, I was thinking, I guess the department probably knows best where they need some help and where they would need and utilize another FT, and that's why we, in talking with staff, we kind of decided maybe putting that department discretion in there, um, not dictating for the department what they need, but rather just a you know, empowering them to have the money to do what they need. So that was kind of where my thought was with um, with that uh, discretion stuff. Great. Okay, other questions about this? Okay, so it'd be $100,000 for uh, the economic development staff position that is uh, yet to be uh, fully decided on, on what exactly that is. And this was just a placeholder amount um, that staff has seen as typical um, for salary and benefits. The council could adjust it if you felt like it. Okay. Council Member Rogers. Um, how, how do you do vacancy savings on this when this person, when would they be hired? I mean, that, that's a fair question. I think it would, vacancy savings would be sort of a one-time one -time source, money. obviously, I'm but, just, you just know, you could. looking at that, thinking, well, what? 110,000 thrown out there. When are they going to be hired, right? Right, right. It's valid. Okay. Councilmember Fowler? Would there be a way in the future to maybe recapture any of that savings if there was the vacancy savings in either a budget amendment, like at the, at the end of the year or throughout the year, right? So, yep. I mean, at least we're, we're, like I said, sort of empowering the, we heard that there was a need empowering that, that department to go and do what they need to do, but then if, if it doesn't happen, then we kind of get to get some of it back at least, right? Okay, so as long as we are, you know, we're, we're pretty clear that that money is for that position, um, and I, so I think, you know, however we, we do this, we just need to ensure that, um, you know, that that's the case so that it's not just, the, 
you know, that if there is, you know, vacancy, if there are vacancy savings that, um, that it's not used by the department, but it, it does come back per the intent of, of the council. Okay, so with that, with that um, intent in there, thumbs up uh, that we support that $100,000, $110,000 amount. Thumbs down that we oppose it. Okay. And okay. that is unanimous. Um, the next item that was starred for additional funding, if it was available, was the traffic calming um, sort of catch-all program. Um, it could be an FTE, it could be CIP programs. I believe you asked the administration to <clears throat> take the amount and come back with a proposal for the council to consider. Right now there's $100,000 in there, so we just wanted to report back. Okay, any discussion on the traffic calming piece? Councilmember Johnston? Yeah, unfortunately I hadn't had a chance to talk much to Ken, I apologize about it, um, <clears throat> about the traffic calming concept. Um, One-time funding could be helpful if it gets us to an uh, understanding of what could be used long-term. I think for me this would, and well, two things. One was uh, Fifth North, uh, the death on Fifth North has taken us a year just to um, try to get to because of funding. Uh, staff levels, a lot of needs. You just can't get to things that quickly. And um, I think there's needs like that that are immediate in residential areas uh, for kids particularly. Um, and it's happened in my neighborhood in the last few weeks. And we've also had issues this year with uh, traffic crossings at schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that all sort of, that's my intent of this, but I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody about it. Um, so I'm willing to go forward with it if there's an idea you might have um, to utilize it effectively on a one-time basis. Otherwise, I'm not sure one-time is helpful there. Not that will turn down money, I'm sure. So John, John Larson <laughs> and Jennifer McGrath are here from uh, CAN and uh, Transportation. I don't mean to put you on the spot because it's clearly a council member saying, will you take money or not? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the, uh, my intent is try to get to a, a tangible problem. We just don't have the bandwidth to get to, it sounds like. Um, well, yeah, I think that's, that's part of the problem. Um, and then, you know, the challenge is, uh, you know, if we get an FTE without money for projects. Now, granted, um, you know, we do have additional funding that is coming in. And so, you know, if we did have an extra FTE that was able to focus on traffic calming, particularly, you know, pedestrian safety near schools, what we would do is have that person really focus on um, coordinating with other projects that are already happening and seeing often you, you can uh, work in traffic calming elements for a small incremental uh, ad, you know, addition. Um, and then the, the biggest thing is the community outreach, working with uh, you know, community groups and the schools and the, and the parents. Um, that's a, that's a really big lift on staff time as far as, you know, so even if we do have money available, um, that, that's just something that, uh, it's, it's really time intensive. So uh, Mr. Chair, I would, if we do this on a one-time basis, I would ask it be a pilot project in a sense that have, we come back with some measurables uh, about what it accomplished and did it increase our capacity or our outreach or whatever it was. Um, so we could reevaluate next year, for instance, and see if it's, uh, something worthy to look at as a greater piece of the budget. Council member, I think that makes a lot of sense. So uh, with that, if there's no further discussion, uh, thumbs up that you support a pilot project for $100,000 uh, one-time money to, be, to go to transportation for the use in, in uh, traffic calming. Council member, The traffic calming is for the implementation of infrastructure or it is for the position? It is for, I think, all of it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I, that, so that would be enough for, for one FTE. Yeah. I'm, and and if it was for if, an FTE, if we were to look at, if we were to look at hard to transportation costs, that would be more in the CIP I, realm. I'm, I think I have similar concerns to Andrew of funding this FTE with one-time funding and also an interest in focusing it on um, areas around schools and other sensitive crossings that uh, I, I just hear so much about um, with a frustration about planters in the road and wanting more of like pedestrian safety. And, and I know slowing vehicles down gets to pedestrian safety, but I'm more interested in the pedestrian component than the planter component. May I offer maybe a suggestion, a thought? Um, 
because it is hard to have an FTE with no funding, and then it's hard to have funding with no FTE. Um, as part of our budget, we have asked for the line item um, to cover the costs for the improvements that we want to do on 5th North. Um, what if we added some additional funding to that line item that is not will not go towards 5th North, but will rather go to other traffic calming issues or to deal with the kinds of issues that you've brought up today um, via that same line item, utilizing to the ability that we can, the staff that we have, um, to try to use that $100,000 for something that is beyond 500 North and tracking that and being able to come back during the next budget conversation to say how we were able to deploy those funds, what the impact of that was, um, what the burden of that was on staff and able to be able to deploy those funds or what the challenges were for us um, regarding that. And then we can have a larger discussion about whether or not we're ready to move forward with an additional FTE and ongoing funding. Yeah, I mean that is that is you know essentially you know a pilot project for that. So I I think that rather than a person, rather than, rather than, rather than, than, than a, rather than an FTE, but just just having that funding available <laughs> um, to figure you know just so that you can figure it out, and then hopefully that could give you a better idea you know for next year's budget if you you know if when you do come forward with an FTE, if there are additional things that worked or things that didn't work that you can also include in that budget, so. Yeah, and I, I guess the one thing that I would add is um, understanding which of the FTEs that we've put forward in the mayor's recommended budget are getting funded through those other mechanisms will help us determine what our capacity is for being able to deploy another $100,000 worth of, of funds. Great. Yeah. Council Member Johnston. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm putting you in an interesting and comfortable position, right? Great. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. I, I, I'm just trying to get out. I've get a, I live in a residential area. I have a lot of kids, and I get a lot of um, concerns about residential streets, sometimes around parks, sometimes around schools. Um, just in the last month, uh, Redwood Road and Indiana Avenue, 7 South and uh, Concord and Arapahoe, I believe. Um, clearly around Franklin Elementary on 3rd. So I've had numerous of these issues with usually kids or uh, in kid-friendly areas where cars, accidents, those things are happening. Um, so that's my intent. And if you have flexibility, you think, to sort of try and deploy these funds and figure out if there's a way we can make an impact more quickly, I'd love to fund it. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, we're really trying to figure out how to weave this into everything else we do. So, like, for example, um, we have uh, some two citizen CIP requests that have uh, were, were funded in previous years, one for Poplar Grove and one for Rose Park. Um, and so these are kind of north-south um, connectors. Um, but we're also adding uh, bus routes that need first-last mile enhancements to make it safer to walk and bike there. Um, so the neighborhood byways can help with that, um, but the citizen CIP, you know, that 600,000 is, we don't know how much we need, but it's turning out that it's not nearly enough to do the full, um, the full system. Um, but then that also provides the opportunity to look at traffic calming options for all of the east-west cross streets, right? Um, and so we can, ideally, we're able to kind of bundle all of these things so that we're accomplishing multiple objectives with the same projects. And so that's really what we're looking at and working towards, um, recognizing there's still going to be standalone projects that are for traffic calming or, as we're preferring to call it, neighborhood street livability. Mm. Um, you know, so we're meeting with a uh, you know, community group you know, near, uh, like up on 2030 East, there's a kind of a growing group where we're looking at a variety of um, crosswalk enhancements that will probably just be a standalone project. Um, we haven't identified funding for it yet, but that's um, you know, something that we're, we're continuing to look at. Um, but I, 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 I guess I see this as something where it's going to have to be an ongoing dialogue, um, but we really look forward. To, I think there's going to be some exciting stuff happening in the, the next year. And um, you know, we've requested four other FTEs um, uh, that are in the, the mayor's budget. Um, so, yes, of course, we'd want more staff. I'm not going to say I've done, but uh, I, I'm comfortable 
working this out over the next year to see kind of where things go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, thumbs up that we support the $100,000 uh, for a pilot program in transportation for traffic calming. Thumbs down that we oppose it. Great. Thank you. That <clears> is so, unanimous. <laughs> thanks. So the next items, um, the intention wasn't to have you straw poll each of these things, so I'll skip over the ones that you didn't star unless you want to revisit them, but it was more of a sense of trying to track ongoing expenses, ongoing revenues, things like that. So <coughs> we've treated the green team restoration and the place for your stuff and Portland Loo restoration as ongoing revenue, or as ongoing expense additions rather than one-time expense additions. Just correct me if that's not the right thing. Um, the next item is a new item that was raised um, since Thursdays, uh, $48,000 for the road home. I believe Councilmember Johnston can speak to that. Mr. Chair. Councilmember Johnston. Um, in the past, we've funded 92000 for the Midvale Family Shelter as an emergency winter shelter to decrease um, burden downtown on our Rio Grande area. Um, so a direct benefit to the city to help fund that Murray's location. That's gone full time now, so it's really not the city's jurisdiction or sort of our responsibility in some ways. However, uh, for a one-time deal this year, because the transition from the, the Rio Grande area to the three new resource centers is happening but might be slightly delayed or there's some, um, the road home is going to have to sort of open up a new facility and keep the same one open temporarily for a bit. It's going to strain them, I think, quite a bit with the limited funding in the state. Um, so I'm requesting to put half of what we generally put into the Midvale on a one-time basis this year for that transition to help them operationally. Okay. Any discussion to uh, Councilmember Johnston's request? Seeing none, thumbs up that we support the one-time use of $48,000 uh, to the road home in Midvale. No. Not in Midvale, Not specific in Midvale. to just Salt Lake. Just to the new road home, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, um, yeah. the intent is to help the, the Rio right. Grande location to be safe through this transition so we don't have other issues come up. Got it. Okay, thumbs up that you support that, thumbs down that you oppose it. Okay. And that is unanimous. Great. Uh, the next item, um, we added already the 92000 for, uh, we'll, we'll clarify the language there because I don't believe it's a housing rehab program. We'll work Business. on the language. And housing, yep. or just a building? We facade. could just say building. <laughs> building Let's facade. just say buildings. <laughs> Great. Um, then um, skipping down to uh, fire, shifting the um, six FTEs and the training um, and paramedic incentives funding, which had previously been funded from one-time savings through the funding our future category through the savings um, experienced by uh, the fact that the police officers weren't going to be hired until October, rather than funding them through that source, funding them through the ongoing um, revenue source of uh, general fund. And our recognition of the need for additional firefighters, um, plus the, um, the new growth revenue allows us to, uh, allows us to use this uh, resource rather than, than the funding our future. Um, as, as I mentioned before, it's always better to use one time or ongoing for ongoing expenditures and one time for one time whenever possible. And I possible. should clarify, sorry, Mr. Chair, the line item above the 168 is also in addition to something that the council didn't have the funds to come back to is reinstating yeah, $28,000 yeah, to the full, yes. full 150 for training for fire. So those three line items together, you could consider those three line items together or consider them separately either okay, way. And the training and paramedic incentives, one of the difficulties that the department has had, um, is incentivizing um, current firefighters to um, go through the process of receiving their paramedic certification. Uh, this is a program that the, the department that would allow the department to, to help with that. So let's drop all these three things together. Um, thumbs up that we support uh, these three items. Thumbs down that we oppose them. And that is unanimous. Great. Can I can I just uh, say something real Fowler. quick? I know. Um, I just, uh, I pre I'm, I'm so grateful that we had new funding, uh, new growth, so that we were able to fund this with ongoing money. But I also want to say um, thanks to the council members here for uh, recognizing that public safety does include all three of our departments and being willing to kind of scrape together what we could to make sure that we were getting our fire department what, what they needed. Um, it kind of we knew what we were doing with one-time kind of funding, but hoping that we would be able to find it in the in the future. 
no pun intended, mm -hmm. finding our future, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm just really grateful that we were able to have this new growth and continue this. So yep. thanks council members for taking that chance and then yay that we don't have to not support it, right? Yes. So. Okay. Um, uh, so that, sorry. So we, yeah, we did that, that was unanimous, mm -hmm. okay. So that brings us um, actually related to that item. Now that the fire um, FTEs are funded through uh, general fund dollars, um, that leaves the question of the one-time savings that was captured from the police um, positions not being hired until October. The council could reverse that decision. Um, however, it would likely fund, fall to fund balance anyway at the end of the year because the police department has indicated the soonest they could hire those officers would be October 1st. So you could take um, those one-time dollars and reprogram them within the funding our future categories, one of the funding our future categories uh, for a one-time need. The obvious one-time need that staff thought of was infrastructure because that's always there's always infrastructure needs, and it's one time. It's just streets. Um, so that was just a placeholder, but you know there are other, probably other considerations that the council and, could and make. And I would, I will speak to this placeholder. Um, we, you know, one of the uh, hopes was that you know with some of the new growth revenue that that we would be able to put money to um, infrastructure and CIP. Um, that is always difficult because as we go through this process, especially you know where we are right now, um, money gets spent on a lot of very worthwhile things. Um, and so I would, I would strongly encourage us to um, stick with the, you know, with that remaining amount, the $289,000, 367 uh, to uh, streets. It still stays within funding our future. Um, and it helps us as we, um, when we start having the, the conversation about CIP in a few months. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Councilmember Johnston, or, or <laughs> Councilmember Rogers. Oh my gosh. And then Councilmember Mendenhall. Uh, what will this $289,000 get us in infrastructure? I guess that's just my question. Um, Any idea? I mean, how much street would that get us? How much curb and gutter would that get us? Ben can probably, I'm looking to Ben, because no, he has a handy He's cheat it, sheet. Yeah. But I, I, I want to say that certain local street reconstruction projects are often in the 250. I mean, you know, transportation. It, inflation never helps us, right? I mean, it's probably a lot shorter section of road than it used to be. Residential city street. Right, or ADA ramps or sidewalks. Yeah. So it would be a small project for sure. Or but. State Street uh, ADA things. ramps or whatever yeah. we're looking at, right? Yeah. Okay. And we're not, we're not, you know, telling them where to spend it. It's just, you know, they have that flexibility. It would uh, be, um, sorry, go ahead. Just to give you a couple examples, this would be like a new dog park or new tennis courts in a park or a new restroom. Uh, so it would be a smaller CIP expenditure, but it would fully pay for some of the regular uh, projects that the, uh, the city funds through CIP. But I thought we were just talking we are, about streets. We are just talking about streets. So even if it is, uh, even if it goes to CIP, it's it just for, it, it'd right. just be for streets. So Councilmember Mendenhall. I guess, like Councilmember Johnston right there. <laughs> Don't. I just, I just wanted to make sure that our streets crew can take on, I guess it's not that big of a project, but sometimes we give money and we don't have the staffing to use it, and I just want to make sure we do. Well, and, what, and while they're on their way up, maybe what staff could clarify is that we, what we would likely do is add it to the total in your CIP budget deliberations and um, see if there were projects that are on the log that are not currently funded that are eligible for that sort of infrastructure category of funding our future. And then that way, more projects could get funded from existing project applications. And Lisa Schaefer, come on down. Well, Lisa's coming up just real quick. Didn't we have, maybe staff can remind me of this, but I remember, and I think I saw it somewhere in one of these things that we get, um, that we, last year when we were doing Funding Our Future, we had a legislative intent that any um, new growth would go to infrastructure and streets, right? Did right. you say that and I was not I listening to you? I did, but we... Uh, Usually it's the other way around, Charlie, oh, so... Oh, please. So, but we did, we did, you know, just because of the, a lot of the changes that we're making right now, um, we've, we've siphoned that off, so that would allow at least some... Uh, yeah, it, no, no, no. I, I'm in support yeah, of this. I was yeah, just no, I, remembering yeah. that legislative intent. That, that, so. yeah, that's, kinda how, that's why it's different this year, because usually it's just been whatever's left over, and now there is nothing left over, and so this is a way to at least get something. Just a clarification on that intent. It wasn't new growth property tax revenue. It was reven revenue for funding our future 
above the budgeted amount would go to CIP for street infrastructure. And that is still included for your adoption tonight. And in the past, we've also done that with new growth too. So, and but, the, but, uh, yeah. the update for the 289,000, that would pay for one lane mile of an asphalt overlay. So there's one project. Yeah. One lane for how long? One lane one mile. mile. One lane mile. <laughs> one mile at a time. Okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask a clarifying question. Is, is the intent that this would be for reconstruction or for overlays? Uh, whatever. whatever we are, we are and, not, and we, we are not being I don't specific. think the, the council would need to figure that out right this second, but maybe before the council goes through their CIP allocation process in July and August, we can have more conversations with the admin about. You know, where, where it's relevant is that if it were intended or if, if the best use of the money would be in reconstruction, and then I could work with community and neighborhoods to add that to a contract, perhaps. Like Ben mentioned, that is that does equate to about one lane mile. We are currently on track to do 100 lane miles uh, in this fiscal year. And in next fiscal year, we're on track to do about 155 lane miles. If we were to say 156, I'm pretty sure that we could accommodate that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that is also weather dependent. So just right. one word of caution yeah, and, there. And with that, we will, you know, we're doing something that we don't always do, which is giving you the discretion on how to sure. spend it. So <laughs> right on. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thumbs up that we support that. Thumbs down that we oppose it. <clears throat> okay. That is unanimous. And then the last item um, was a potential, maybe a staff suggestion. There were, and, and so I hope... Hopefully it's accepted. There were a couple of questions as um, finance staff and our staff was going through the property tax numbers from the state tax commission that caused us a little bit of questions. So we're gonna work with them over the next few weeks to make sure that we're understanding it in the right way. But just in case we aren't, um, suggesting kind of reserving just a little bit of that new growth or just a little bit of that total revenue. In this case, it would be one-time revenue to put in fund balance in case um, uh, some things you know are worked out over the next few weeks that result in a need to and with that so that's the hundred and nineteen thousand four hundred and twenty two right. that you have on the right chart it, it's just a balancing figure but putting it in fund balance doesn't hurt and if we don't need it you can apply you can reappropriate it in the first or second budget amendment Great. i think well, andrew would be well. opposed to that i think andrew would be opposed to putting yeah, money in the fund andrew, balance andrew wants to spend <laughs> down our fund balance okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Um, do do we I don't, do we need to straw poll? Yeah, let's straw poll that one just to be safe. Thumbs up that we uh, put the hundred nineteen thousand into fund balance, uh, just in case there's anything else that comes up. Thumbs down that we oppose that. Okay, great. And that is oh, unanimous. That's it. So now we'll go back to uh, the per council member Mendenhall's uh, suggestion that we um, push the. Parking fee meter. increase, the parking fee increase of 25 cents uh, to the end. We've now gone through everything. We know what the money is. Um, Council Member Mendenhall. I think we should do a straw poll to accept a 25 cent increase on parking meters. Okay, so the, the poll would be a 25 cent increase. Um, thumbs up that we support that, thumbs down that we oppose it. Council Member Rogers. Just a quick reminder, can we, do we have any comparables of other municipalities that might be our same size, their rate, what they're looking at, just to have an idea of what we're going to be looking at voting on. I know that's something new, but we, pro yeah, probably not this minute, but um, we can do a little research, see how quickly we can get you some comparables. I'm just looking to see: are we overpriced? Are we underpriced? I mean, that would help me make my decision. Okay. Well, and and I will be I will be supporting. I'll support it, but I still want to know. I'll, I'll be supporting it. I have my concerns not just because it's a fee increase but because it's a fee increase with zero public process there was no discussion uh leading up to this we've we've had the same issue with another department uh, that we've been talking about and i think anytime you increase fees without having any sort of public dialogue it is it is less than transparent um, and you know, is something that we need to we need to avoid. Unfortunately, in this one, um, you know, where we are right now, um, we're stuck. So, Mr. Chair, I will be supporting it, um, but I am not thrilled with the process. Councilmember Mendenhall. Well, I agree with you about public process around fee and rate increases. This one, in particular, for me, is unique because we know 
and we have a recent parking study that there are a lot of parking options downtown. Our meters are one of those parking options. There are some free parking options. There are some privately owned parking options. So while our garbage pickup, you know, our, our sure. residents don't have an option on that one, we do have options on where to park downtown to an extent. So yeah, and for me, it's just it's a principle of transparency. But because of the budget, I'll I, I'll support it. So it makes uh, us a little bit more nimble too. Thumbs up that we support that. Thumbs down that we oppose it. Uh, the twenty five cent increase on parking. Okay, that is unanimous. Great. So that's all for that sheet. Thank you for working through all of that. You, um, Lehua, do you want to get us back onto the discussion outline? Thanks. <laughs> So, um, that was helpful to get us through several of these items, but I'll just touch on them to make sure that everyone agrees. Um, under the council straw hold items that we wanted to get back to was the rehab program, which was done, the discussion on traffic calming, which was done, um, additional um, discussion on these two economic development uh, budget items, that was done. Um, <coughs> This um, funding for training in the fire department and o &M was done, and the um, $48,000 for road home was done. So, um, and then this item C was referring to the last item that you straw, or the second to last item that you straw pulled, the $119,000. Um, the next item that we have is to prompt a conversation about the housing funding and what's changing to make sure that we have um, council direction and agreement on how the budget documents are written. Um, I don't know if that's something either Cindy or Jennifer want to do an intro on and then probably the best one of the things that we should do is go through the ordinance and make sure that that language is consistent with what the council is telling us to do. Mm -hmm. So I think the document to look at first might be if you could pull it up um, would be the um, Council budget adoption ordinance. Um, the council had indicated and desire to um, add a number of contingent appropriations relating to um, your understanding about housing, and they appear in mostly in the budget ordinance, although they're also in the RDA budget adoption ordinance, which is item number, let's see, the Salt Lake City budget adoption ordinance is one, the RDA is two. two. Thank Sorry, you. We <laughs> oh, we switched the order. Um, anyway, the, there's some housing language in both of those ordinances uh, that lays out the council's intent of what moving funding is and is not in housing and um, clarifying that intent. And Cindy, I don't know if you have anything to add there. One of the things that um, the council has had us working on for a while, um, and stop me if I'm belaboring it, but um, the whole concept of creating a one-stop location, and um, there's been discussion with the council, with the administration about it. Um, there, I think that the administration had their reasons for thinking that things shouldn't be combined, but from a from a budget oversight budget perspective, oversight perspective, and policy perspective, the council had instructed us to try to look for a way to combine the processes mm -hmm. so that there is one time, one every housing developer that wants city assistance comes in and applies one time um, for each project. They, they go through one due diligence process. They go through one public board process. They go through one negotiation process and um, one approval process. So the, um, and people have asked, why does the council keep referring to this being um, faster, a faster way to get money out uh, into housing? And, and that is because you would reduce the processing um, by up to 50%. Uh, sometimes it would be more than that, and that is because um, there's a lot of rework that we've observed happens because there are two separate departments that are working on it. So that's um, that's what we were working on here in this ordinance, trying to articulate that. And, um, and then the other, Oh, I'm telling the wrong thing, aren't I? Are we on, I'm on the wrong one? No, that's it. 
Okay, is that it? Okay. Because I was just thinking this, the housing ordinance piece. That's one related piece to what you were also, discussing. Also, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this piece, so I'll just <laughs> skip to this other one too. Um, the, the funding, our future funding, um, is is in the block you guys are tracking it carefully the administration is tracking it carefully and um one of the things that the council asked us to do is to look at um whether it's an administrative function or a legislative function to actually allocate the the funds um to the specific areas and um, you could probably argue it either way, but it is entirely um, acceptable for the council to set up a system that mirrors the other grant programs that the city has, the uh, federal grant programs, the uh, CDBG, but to expedite, make it shortened, uh, an abbreviated process so that the um, public gets notice of what funds are available um, the administration could put out what you know what they perceive as the needs also and then um, there's an opportunity for any organization to apply uh, there's at least a 14-day time period um, and then the mayor right makes recommendations to the council so it's all in a public process including a public hearing so again not to delay it but to um, give the opportunity to all organizations um, to participate in that um, if they feel like they can provide a service that the administration has identified. Uh, we had several questions from people who said, well, why did, why did the administration choose this organization or that organization? And um, it's pretty easy why they cho it's pretty easy to see why they chose particular organizations because that's what they do but it turns out there are others who might have been interested in applying so so uh, the idea would be that the uh, council would um, consider a, an ordinance that would spell out that process and that's on page four of the draft ordinance that you have in front of you and just as an, a suggestion, if it's too um, if it's too much in the weeds to go through the actual ordinance language, um, the council can take a look at it. Our challenge is that because it's actually in the ordinance language, we need any edits before well before seven, so that, so that you guys can adopt the budget. Since the contingent appropriation language is actually going to be in the budget adoption ordinance itself. So I guess the question is: has, Have you had a chance to? Has everyone had a chance to review it? No. Okay. Um, so what will Council Member Fowler? Um, let's. I'm trying to think if we could if if we had you read it over dinner and make any changes. To, I don't know if that gives staff time to. The, the let's do this. Let's take a break, take a break right break. now. Right. Um, 30 minutes. Let's come back at, uh, is 10 minutes okay? Yeah. To read this? Huh? To yeah. read this? To read through it? Or do you need more? Do you want 20? I think, well, I would, yeah, I would do 20 just okay. so that. Okay, let's do 4 o'clock, or 5 o'clock, okay. so we'll come back. And then if you need a staff member. Yep. And just, <clears throat> and just so that if there's any concerns, we will discuss all the changes when we come back at 5. Yeah, but just have a chance to read it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll be, uh, we'll all be back at our, um, at our desks reviewing that. Okay, okay. thank chair. you. Uh, yeah, Councilmember Johnson. Has a copy been admit, uh, given to the administration of this? Yes, we gave review? it last night, last night to them. Okay. <coughs> and I believe, I hope Cindy Lou was able to get a copy back to David. Were you? Okay. Have it. He has it online, but. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, all right, we will be back at five o'clock. Um, we are in the middle of our in the middle of our unfunded or unresolved issues discussion. Um, there, we took a break to review the housing um, document uh, that was out. And so, um, Jennifer, do you want to walk us through that? I know that Councilmember um, Fowler has a suggestion uh, to that document. So we can just open it up to suggestions because I think what we were thinking is that you would all have time to read the ordinances and um, make suggested language changes, so we can just start there. Great. Okay, Council Member Fowler. Yeah, so um, thank you for uh, taking a break. Right when I was sort of getting into this, I realized something that I wanted to, to clarify, and um, 
I appreciate staff for working really hard on getting some added language to this ordinance in order to make a couple of those clarifications. And that's if um, on this ordinance on page five, um, subsections, subsection B on that, that page um, talks about the housing trust fund and the, the sort of move that we're doing from moving that to, from um, hand into <coughs> RDA. And we're adding some language of on a trial basis. As I've talked with everybody, as I mentioned earlier, um, when I talk to housing advocates, when I've spoken with council members, uh, that this discussion is an ongoing discussion and um, that this is sort of a trial basis to see if this works the way we're anticipating or, or the way I, I kind of envision and hope that it works is that development goes well with development and housing programs go well with housing programs. And I, I can't commend HAND enough for the work they do with our federal dollars um, and the programs that they have come up with, the Housing 20 stuff, the uh, shared residences. I was there for the, the ribbon cutting on that. Uh, the programming that HAND does and have, have created is really quite impressive. Um, <coughs> and I'm hoping, as again, this is a trial basis, we're going to add that language, that it frees up a little of their time to kind of um, do more of that good programming. And then the development we've seen today um, you know, I, I certainly did not intend to put two feel-good projects at the end of our RDA agenda, but like I said, I'm, I'm glad I did because it's a real example of the work that, that we're doing in the development side of things. Uh, the Brinshore piece, the, um, the, um, oh, well, the distillery was just fun, but the Brinshore piece particularly where we're really looking at how we have mixed income development in the city and we're able to, um, to fund that and, and to have all of these different resources and these tools and, and provide the things that we need to provide. And so, the, again, going back, the idea is, is to, as, as Cindy stated, kind of a one-stop shopping center where it makes things easier for uh, developers. We have a couple of tools for our housing needs and, and really figuring out where is those tools are best placed, I think, is the, the, what we're kind of striving for. So with that language, sorry, there's a lot of background there. With the subsection B, it would be on a trial basis. We'd then ask for um, uh, just a review of how things are going at the six month and the 12 month mark. And I know six months seems uh, like a little too soon, but if people come back and say it's a little too soon to evaluate it, that's okay. At least we're starting that conversation to, to make sure it, it stays a, on a radar. We're also going, I'm, I've suggested anyway, to add some language about the things that we had talked about and the concerns that um, Council Member Johnston brought up, which is having an real in-depth, continuing our in-depth policy discussion on all aspects of housing, <coughs> programming, funding, developing, all of it, um, so that we're really maximizing our assets and we're maximizing our dollars and we're maximizing our efforts um, for housing in the most efficient and effective way. So those were um, my suggestions just to that, that ordinance. Again, I, I wanted to be clear that it was just a year trial basis. That's what we've all talked about. That's what the concerns were and, and kind of how, how we all came together on that. And, yep. and I didn't, when I read that, I was, you might have seen, I sort of stalled and said, ah, wait, we need to fix that because I didn't want anyone to think there was a fast one going on here, but, uh, but that it really is just something to evaluate and see if we're meeting our housing needs the way that, that we should be. Great. Council Member Mendenhall. I would support that recommendation by Council Member Fowler. And um, down, Lehua, if we could, on this point two, I guess it's point B in our, yeah, that we um, add a little word of development so that it's the council intends to establish a housing development trust fund. And, and part of, I just want to give some clarity, not that it's different or would be administrated differently, but the administered rather differently. But I'd like to add some language about the council's intention to um, have housing 
programming funds administered through hand or remain in um, under the administration of CAN. And I wonder if... I can't quite hear you. Sorry. I wonder if that would be up on the bottom of page four under housing funding, but Cindy would know better than I do. No, oh, Cindy. I'm sorry. I was I just stepped out working on this. Um, I have some suggestions from uh, Council Member Fowler and from Council Member Mendenhall. If you can skip to another section, I can start getting that together so you don't have to do it on the fly. Okay. Is that okay to the, with the council? Yeah. Yeah. I shared that. So are you talking, so um, Cindy, just to, to clarify, you, so skipping ahead, you're not talking about skipping ahead in the ordinance, you're talking about just moving on the agenda and then coming back to this issue, correct? Either way, I, we just need like 10 minutes or okay. something. Let's go through, let's go through the rest of the, uh, the rest of the items on unresolved and then we'll come <coughs> back to this. That should that give okay? you a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are, are, are you okay with that, Council Member Mendenhall? I have one little um, okay. piece on the ordinance. Okay. Are, are you staying in the ordinance or moving? No, back we're gonna to, we're gonna we'll come so back to the ordinance. But if there, there's if a couple of different sections in the ordinance that we could probably do while other housing work okay. is done, the ordinance is just so big that yeah, I worry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If yeah. you want if you want to do that, you can take us to or. Council so if there Member are Mendenhall, other sections that council where, members have. Yeah. On page three A, which is police department, I wanted to. In, encourage the police department to position those six new employees with the park ranger program in the bike squad division. I know we can't yeah. explicitly direct that, but if we could encourage a request. Right. So one of the options, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> was to, is to just use language that's a little softer about um, the council encourages, which I think appears in one of the other um, sections, knowing that um, it it won't, that particular piece of it won't be a funding contingency, but you're putting your preference Intention. for the record. Yeah. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, any other comments um, on, on this ordinance? Yeah. Council Member Valdemoros. I just wanted to add at the public, so at point B, the 4th Avenue well. Um, so to reduce the building size and address noise concerns and also um, address health hazards, can we add that to that language that, that we get to know um, mitigation if something happens or if there's going to be a health hazard with this chlorine at the, yeah, building size, address noise concerns and address health hazards. Okay. Uh, questions about that? <coughs> Great. Other suggestions from the council? Uh, Councilmember Wharton. Councilmember Valdemoros, did you already make the change to Part B? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, hold on, yeah. okay, so okay. we're, I think we're good with, good I with the I ordinance, hear from anybody else on the, All the right. ordinance, council member Mendenhall, do you have any, anything else, okay, um, so we'll come back to that to deal with the, uh, the housing piece, right, and that may also affect the RDA, Resolution. So let's just keep bookmark that and okay. come back to it. You want to? I think we're on back. three. <coughs> um, just as an FYI, and we can go through the motion sheet in more detail. But we have listed. Um, oh, this is for the holding account items. The motion sheet includes as one of the legislative intents a list of each of the holding accounts that the council has set up in your discussion. So that will be just a one place where there's an inventory of those projects that have been placed into a holding account. Um, we also just wanted to confirm with the council that the mayor's office sent additional information on uh, the plans for building an equitable city. Those, both the positions and the initiative funding that was included in the mayor's recommended budget. And so we are confirming with the council that 
um, we would place that on for a briefing sometime in July after conferring with the chair vice chair on the schedule. Um, and then our next larger item of discussion would be uh, sustainability. Okay, so council on, on sustainability, um, we straw polled on Thursday um, to hold uh, a number of items uh, that uh, were there. A few um, projects for $430,000. Yeah, so there, with those projects, um, I think there was the, the you know, perception that, that we had unfunded those. Those were not unfunded, they were funded, um, but they were held until, um, you know, we received some information back uh, from sustainability um, that clarified some of the, some of the questions that we had. Um, what I would like to propose is that we, we add contingency language to the ordinance um, requesting or, or basically making funding contingent, uh, making funding contingent upon the department providing quarterly written briefings to the council on programs and budget and progress on public engagement for a possible rate increase, et cetera. So we will not be doing the rate increase um, this year, but um, hearing back you know, in a quarterly fashion um, written briefings from sustainability about these projects and how that money is going to be spent. Um, the rest of the language would read, the council may choose to schedule briefings once quarterly written updates are transmitted to continue these valuable conversations throughout the year. Uh, with that contingency language, um, I would recommend that we, f that we release the hold on those sustainability, on, on all of the sustainability uh, programs, the $400,000, um, or, or the ones totaling 400,000, Lihua. Um, sorry, I think it would actually be release the hold on 380,000 of that because there was 50,000 in that amount that related to the building in an equitable city. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. So um, so basically, not the not the you know building an equitable city piece, but the rest of it, um, the the hold would be lifted, and we would. Uh, but but the funding contingency would be dependent upon. Uh, the quarterly written briefings to the council. Uh, and Cindy. The, the only thing that would happen with the um, equity piece is that that would be combined into a conversation with the council so that the council can understand how to, it relates to the two sets of funding that are in um, the community and neighborhood department and also the current role of human resources in the training. So that was that that's why that piece was um, set apart. Great. Um, one other point that I that I want to make about this, um, the whole, the council's hold on these sustainability programs had nothing to do with the merit of those programs. Um, it had to do with the fact that there was specific information that the council was requesting uh, and that we needed to have in order to make a you know, well thought out decision. And that is our responsibility. We are the budgetary um, body of the city and it is important for us to take that seriously. And so when we ask departments for information, it's important that we get that information. Uh, we were having a tough time getting some of that information. Uh, we feel now that, that we're in a much better spot uh, with the, the way that uh, sustainability is, has been able to uh, react in the past week. Um, and so with that, we're willing to, you know, I, I would recommend that we, that we lift that. But again, <clears throat> you know, for the public listening, this is this, you know, that decision last week wasn't because we don't like sustainability, because we don't love our mother earth. It was because we had some serious uh, fiduciary questions related to these programs that we didn't have answers for. Um, so with that, I would, I, let's straw poll um, that we add the contingency language uh, to the ordinance and uh, release the hold on uh, the projects totaling 300, Lehua, help me with the 180, number? 180,000. 380,000 dollars. Thumbs up that we support that, thumbs down that we oppose it. <laughs> Chris, do you, do you like sustainability? Oh, you can't <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so um, with that, we'll say uh, that passes six to oh seven. That's unanimous. So great, thank you.
Um, the next item relates to the $35,000 that would be set aside for um, HRC related improvements that the city's consultant suggested and um, community and neighborhood staff is asking whether um, you would authorize their staff to engage now with businesses so that that program can get up and running. It just gives them a little bit of a head start. <clears throat> That be cool. Sorry, I just yes. missed it. On the additional funding that uh, community and neighborhoods will be finding for the um, HRC-related improvement program, this is what the city's consultant had recommended for that area. Um, whether Can is wondering if they could, if their staff could begin engaging with the businesses on those projects, just to get a little bit of a head start before July first. That thumbs up, um, and that is unanimous. Great. Um, so um, I think we're still waiting on the budget ordinance, but maybe what we could do is switch to the motion sheet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have that. It's the big one. Yeah. Number five, if that helps, but it's on the biggest paper. And. Want to walk through it, or who do you do you want me to walk through it? I can go through it. So the motion sheet has, I believe, it's six motions. You'll notice it's a little different than the last few budget adoptions, since the section with funding contingencies is now in the ordinance. The first motion adopts the budget except for the library fund and CIP, which are separate motions. And there is a sub motion 1A for council member Johnston, since he needs to recuse himself on the 500,000 for the VOA mitigation. Uh, staff is not aware of any other recusals, so please let us know if we've missed one. Motion two is adopting the library fund budget. Motion three sets all of the tax rates, and this is for the general fund, the library fund, the judgment levies, one for the general fund, one for the library, as well as the general obligation bonds that the city has, which are several. Motion four is adopting CIP and debt service. The council approves all of the funding going into CIP as part of the annual budget. You also approve all of the money to pay the debt service as part of the annual budget, and the remaining funds are addressed over the summer on a project-specific basis. Motion five is the legislative intents. I don't know if all the council members have had a chance to read through those or if there are particular ones you want to discuss. And then the last motion on the last page six is adopting the other ordinances, uh, most of which are done annually, such as appropriating necessary funds for the three bargaining units, the three unions, as well as the changes for the parking meter increase that was just discussed, and the uh, compensation plan for all non-represented employees. Do you want to mention the order? The order of the ordinances and how it doesn't track exactly with the agenda, just so that they're not... Yeah, just a point of clarity, the order of the motions does not exactly match the order on the agenda. We do reference which item on the agenda, which motion corresponds to, but we didn't have them lined up this time around. Mr. Chair. Council Member Mendenhall. So we've made a few changes that affect <coughs> the motions on here, and um, we should just ignore those now, or should we tick their own? Well, I could go through them quickly, because I've done them here on track changes. I just okay. wanted to note um, here item D under motion six, just so that the council is aware, the administration is working with us to update the consolidated fee schedule to reflect a lower parking meter rate increase and to also back out the proposed rate increase in the sustainability department. So those, the, the file that you'll be adopting tonight reflects those updates based on your conversation. Um, most of the changes that we've made um, are in motion five with the legislative intent. So I'll just scroll to those. Um, we updated. <clears throat> um, 
sorry, thank you. Um, so on motion number five, which is the legislative intent statements, I've received a number of, que or, you know, some questions from council members who would like to, you know, specifically um, read out some of these points instead of just adopting all of the motions in a lump. <clears throat> and so that is something that, that we'll do. So if you, uh, I know that council member Mendenhall has, has requested to read a couple, but if there are uh, legislative intents that you would like to um, read as a council member, please let me know so that we can uh, organize that. Uh, and staff hope it's a sh it's a shortcut that all the language in red on the motion sheet does need to be read aloud. Yes. Everything that's not read would be optional. Okay. All right. So is that clear? So look through look through these these uh, legislative intents. If you want to read something, uh, let me know. And unless somebody else has already claimed it, it's yours. <laughs> Well, that's what that's what y'all need to get. You need to get that to me. So no, we're all reading it. it says no, we we don't we don't have to read them. <laughs> you don't have to read them, but uh, but some have requested to read them, and it is our annual budget, so we, we don't can, have to read them. We can read them. Don't read them too. Okay. Is it okay if I highlight what we've changed in the briefing? Um, the item on traffic calming, which is item H. Um, we changed that to reflect that it would not be an FTE, but it would be a pilot program to do traffic calming initiatives in addition to 500 North. And then also added a note about the administration reporting back to the council on outcomes and a recommendation for future opportunities. <clears throat> The next item is a new one that we added regarding the economic development position. Um, basically that the additional $110,000 would be used for a staff position as needed and that any of the funding that is not used for the new position would either be recaptured or would fall to fund balance. Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sorry, Lehua. Council Member Johnston. Um, if I could go back to the cro uh, H crossing guard for a second. Um, <laughs> I'm not picking to read it. What I'm, I'm, I'm going for is if there's an option from the administration perhaps to use, say, a private company or something along those lines for that purpose, it's not reflected in here. This is sort of, we said a lot of specific things last time about options. Mm -hmm. That's not included in here. Do we want to generalize it a little more to allow other things that we haven't <coughs> talked about yet? Yeah, that was what I was going to bring up as well, is regards to an RFP for looking at outsourcing our crossing guards to a contract. And what type of savings we'd be looking at? Because I know there is savings in looking at outsourcing. So I, I think the it, it says the intent of the council, <coughs> excuse me, is to um, provide a, uh, ask the administration to provide a briefing. That's fine. I think that's true. Um, uh, program staffing challenges uh, relating to staffing. City's responsibility. Goal of further. The goal of further discussion to identify any other opportunities to, for coordination or funding that would improve. So I think um, that probably covers it. I just wanted to make sure here uh, that sure. that would cover any other options that may be brought forward and not limit us. Okay, uh, David Litback has uh, has come to the table. Do you have some specifics? On yeah, that? Mr. Chair, okay. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate Councilmember Johnson's um, catch on that. As we were putting together the budget, recognizing that the crosswalk issue is much deeper than just trying to throw m more money at it, um, the notion of a private entity or privatization or just exploring that option was discussed, and so we would appreciate at least having that uh, as the option and the intent um, as we look at how to uh, best provide that service as a city. And rereading through it, it doesn't look like it would prohibit that in any way. It, but um, might help to clarify it a little. Yeah. Do I don't think, think it would be a major change, though. Like who added a little language? I don't know if that's... So it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so I changed the, sec the sentence that begins with the goal of further discussion um, that it would now read the goal of further discussion is to identify future steps for coordination or funding that would improve the number of crosswalks, staffing and student safety, which may include an RFP and outside contract to provide this service. Thank you, Lahua. Okay. If you wanted it stronger than that, that the administration would be required, then it would probably be best in a contingency rather than here on your legislative intents. No, I don't think my intent is to strengthen it. I think just uh, leave uh, all other options in there. Yeah. Okay.
Great. If we scroll down to the section on um, to the legislative intent regarding the holding accounts, this is what we referred to earlier, that this would serve as an inventory for all of the budget items that the council um, put into a, uh, an appropriated holding account. Um, we've removed the items from environment and energy. Those are the sustainability department items. Um, the And then we have also... Um, combined the landlord insurance pilot into the funding our future housing program holding account that the council identified. And I think that's it in terms of the changes that we've captured, but if council members have any others, we're ready to take those or to put council member names by each item if you'd like us huh? to. Okay, I have I'm a sign-up sheet I'll work, I'll work before the meeting. You. I'll work with you. On, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking them down, so I'll, I'll let you know how that will <laughs> go. Okay, other questions? So the key changes... Okay. Oh, sorry. Is that the, it for the motion sheet? Mm -hmm. Are you going back to the... Are you going to go back to the ordinance, Jennifer? I was just going to say the key doing? changes is the next thing on the outline, but okay. that we're okay. still let's, let's updating. Well, that we're still updating. It's looking good, <laughs> but, but just, we're going to need a little more time. Okay. So we'll have that printed and ready for your places and with the recorder's office and then publicly available copies um, just as a comprehensive line by line of every um, change that the council's made to the budget. And just as a reminder, that's something that is attached as an exhibit to your budget ordinance so that it's um, clear that whatever was adopted as the tentative budget earlier in May, it's a formal step required um, when the city, when the council receives the mayor's recommended budget, the key changes is adopted as an attachment to this ordinance so that it's clear that those are the changes the council's made to the annual budget. Jen, in this updated uh, document that you're going to give us, uh, you're going to provide us, um, is that where the um, building rehab program is going to be at? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we can go back to the. Oh, sorry. We added. I, I did it before we put, this is what the council straw pulled during your building rehab program discussion earlier this afternoon. And so we just, we put it in here. I didn't have it in track changes because you already straw pulled it. Okay. Sorry. Yes, thank you. And so it won't be in the other ordinance because it's just here as a legislative intent. But, but it will be on the, it will be a line item, a separate line item in key changes. So you'll see it both places. And then, so one request that I have, um, if we can get a hard copy mm -hmm. of this to review um, during our dinner break mm -hmm. uh, before the formal meeting, just I'd, I'd like us all to just go back over it real quick and and, and, and like it, it with the track changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If we could get it on a bigger sheet of paper too. This yes. Is pretty small. It's hard to. Yeah. <laughs> hard to read. Chris that is Chris board. is getting punchy. <laughs> Like, We've got a plotter in the back for scrolls. I'd like it on one single long sheet. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> that you could unroll. <laughs> you, need to go to, you, need, <laughs> you need to go to Walgreens and get a Walgreens printer, a receipt printer, and then you can do it. So, so then we can either go back to the housing ordinance or the RDA resolution adoption. Both relate to housing, so not really are sure we, which one makes Are we good sense. on the housing ordinance? Not yet. Okay, so let's go to the RDA. We it, through the door. RDA just has okay. other sections. So in the RDA budget <laughs> adoption um, resolution, because the board adopts things by resolution in the RDA, not the uh, not by ordinance, um, there is reference, and I don't know if you want to scroll down to the housing funding. Um, and this this funding was um, put together to sort of reflect what the intent, uh, some council members expressed intent was. But I'm seeing now it's very integrated with the housing discussion in the city. So I don't know if it makes sense to pause one while we do the other. So that section will be updated once we have the city ordinance side of it updated. And then the last section here on the RDA resolution just refers to the two exhibits. <clears throat> Excuse me, which would be the key changes in the motion sheet, which would be attached to the resolution. Sorry, can you restate that? Um, the, this section of the um, RDA resolution related to housing will be affected by the work that's done on the city ordinance. That right now is the 
a large section okay. of the RDA resolution. And then the last section here refers again to the exhibits, which for RDA will be key changes in the motion sheet. Okay. So, Council, if you're okay with this, um, let's let's move on in our budget because I know that we do have um, some other issues to cover. Um, so we'll we'll go through that and then we'll take our we'll have our dinner break, and then after our dinner break we'll come back and and go over the housing and the RDA piece okay. um, right before um, our formal meeting. If, depending on, on how long it takes us to get through the rest of this, um, since we do have our formal meeting starting at seven o'clock, uh, we may um, have to go through the ordinance over across the hall and just do that before we begin our formal meeting. Is that, does that work for everybody? Do you, you don't need, I'm gonna look to Cindy, you don't need the, uh, oh, the, the projector, do you, over there? I think the challenge is going to be um, if edits are made on the okay. fly. All right. So I don't know how to communicate we'll, okay, those. Scratch that. We'll stay here. And then okay. hopefully we won't have to delay the formal meeting too long. Okay. Okay. So moving on in the agenda, let's go to item number three, which is an ordinance budget amendment number six for fiscal year 2018-19 follow-up. Uh, Mary Beth uh, Thompson and John Vike uh, are here, and they will be at the table with Ben. So Ben, as, as Mary Beth and John make their way to the table, I'll let you start in. Um, yes. This is the second follow-up briefing on budget amendment number six, the last budget amendment of the year. And there are four quick updates for the council, which all relate to impact fees. <laughs> The first update is the administration reports they are working on reviewing the project eligibility for impact fees internally instead of relying on an outside consultant. This would speed up uh, impact fee eligibility review, but it is still currently reliant on an outside consultant. The council asked at the last meeting what the administration's plan is to avoid refunding uh, impact fees for transportation and police. They report $2.2 million is expected to be encumbered before August for the 700 South Phase 6 project. There are also a few smaller projects that are partially eligible for transportation impact fees. If these are encumbered before August, it would push back the date of the next expiration to June 2020. Regarding police impact fees, there are two challenges to create an east side police precinct. The first is a shortage of available land on the east side of the city. And the second is current market conditions favor sellers. And the administration reports some lands that have been looked at are being asked with premium prices, which are more than they want to pay. The Budget amendment number two of fiscal year 19, as a reminder, the council did appropriate three and a half million dollars for an east side police precinct. And this was split 2.3 million with police impact fees and 1.3 million from the surplus land fund. So there's currently three and a half million dollars for an east side police precinct, but the administration is having difficulty finding land on the east side with this funding level. $188,000 of police impact fees are scheduled to expire over the next 12 months. If the council approves just under $11,000 to update the police section of the impact fee facilities plan, the next batch of expiring impact fees would be July, and it's just under $17,000. And absent the Eastside Police Precinct moving forward and absent updating the impact fee plan, police impact fees would expire each month for the next fiscal year. The council also requested at the last meeting estimates to update all sections of the impact fee facilities plan. We did receive those cost estimates. The total is 88,866. This includes just under 11,000 for fire, 11,000 for police, uh, 
7,600 for parks, and just over 59,000 for transportation. Updates to the impact fee facility plan are 100% eligible for impact fees, so you don't need to rely on the general fund to pay for any of these updates. Attachment one to the staff report provides a breakdown of how these cost estimates were uh, calculated and what steps the impact fee consultant would take to update the plan. The administration has already done work on updating the transportation, transportation section of the plan and expects to complete it by the end of the summer or early fall. Updating the other three sections of the plan, they estimate would take 90 to 180 days. There is a policy question for the council about a potential funding contingency. The council previously discussed having the impact fee consultant work for Salt Lake City Corporation, the entity, as well as being available to both branches of government and including the council early in the process to provide policy direction. I think Cindy might have information on this item. Uh, this is Cindy. just one of those items that um, we haven't had time to sort through well enough to give you good information. And so um, I would ask that you not right now include the contingency. Um, and we will just do our best to work with the administration um, on getting that information. They have made some changes in the contract already, uh, but we, we can't get um, language cleaned up for tonight. Okay. So this could be addressed in the first budget amendment of next fiscal year. Okay, is that clear? I, I don't everybody? know if it could, Ben. Once it's adopted, um, then the, the administration can use the money to contract. Oh, I thought you meant to hold off on the appropriation until no, there was I time think, to work I mean, on it. it. It's been delayed. I, don't, I, w I wouldn't suggest that the council hold off on the appropriation. I, I think we are where we are. We just don't have time to get it figured out, and we, and you, as far as I know, the council has wanted to expedite this as opposed to taking more time. So I would just suggest you go ahead and appropriate the funds, and then we'll do our okay. best to work with the administration from there. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. We'll update the motion sheet so the full eighty-eight thousand will be approved, so all sections of the plan are funded for updates. Okay. And then the last item is a clarification on item A6. It originally was transmitted to the council with fire impact fees and transportation impact fees being split to update the transportation section of the plan. Council members asked why it was coming from fire and transportation. This was inadvertently included. It can be fully funded using transportation impact fees. And the motion sheet will clearly state that. And I just want to point out the reason the transportation section is so much more expensive to update than the other three is because it involves uh, more steps of analysis as well as two contracts, one with the impact fee consultant and one with a transportation consultant. Please, Councilmember Mendenhall. Thanks for all these updates, Ben. Back to the 90 to 180 days on the other three sections of the IFFP. Was that on the heels of the transportation segment or 90 to 180 from now? It's from when the contract is signed with the impact fee consultant. Oh, so okay. not now, but sometime in the near future, the clock okay. would start counting. Thanks. That's it, you're scheduled to vote on budget amendment number six tonight. Okay, any questions uh, or comments about this? All right, thank you all. Uh, item number four on our agenda, an ordinance revised FBUN2 building height zoning text amendment. Uh, Nick Tarbett, um, will, he's our council office policy analyst and he will join us at, uh, be joined at the table by Casey Stewart, the senior planner. And then I did see uh, the applicant in the audience, uh, James Alfandre. Um, so Nick. Okay. Um, the council may remember this. This is an item that the council discussed last fall. Um, it's a request to amend the FBUN2 zoning district to allow uh, greater height at the corner of 900 South and Washington Street. Um, when the council discussed this last year, the original proposal was for the corner, corner parcel at 231. 
Um, throughout the discussions, the um, applicant increased the size of the pit, the application to include a few more properties. So that's why the council asked this to go back to the planning commission for a review and a recommendation. Um, the planning commission did recommend a positive recommendation this time around. And so we'll, I'll let Casey from here explain um, the, the process up to this point. Thank you. So correct, this is a an amendment, a zoning text amendment to recommend additional height in areas of the FBUN2 zoning district. Uh, on the screen you can see the properties outlined in, uh, in, that are in question. Uh, initially this, this started with a corner parcel up on the, the far left corner uh, right here and has expanded to be now what's in yellow. The Planning Commission considered this request and, uh, and ultimately voted in favor of recommending approval, um, primarily based on the old Henry's dry cleaner site that um, had a con contamination that extended over to other properties. Uh, here's another aer aerial view of the site. And you'll notice along 900 South, Uh, there was a, a parcel that was not included in that recommendation and that parcel was um, we were unable to contact the property owner and the applicant was un unable to reach an agreement with that property owner to include that so that is not included. Um, but essentially the request is for one additional story of height on the, all those properties outlined and um, a map uh, in, indicated in your materials would be included in the zoning ordinance to clearly depict which parcels are eligible for that additional height. Okay, uh, questions from the council? Councilmember Johnston. Sure. Uh, thank you. I do understand the Planning Commission forwarded a positive recommendation. Uh, one concern that was brought up from the public was a lack or not enough um, uh, public input on this particular issue. Can you talk to that a little about what was the public outreach on this uh, particular change in uh, this process? Once it was referred back to the Planning Commission, we sent uh, notification to the two community councils, the Ballpark and the Central Ninth Community Councils. Uh, they did not discuss it at a meeting uh, or provide additional comments, uh, although I did receive a, a follow-up letter from the uh, Central Ninth Community Council, which was a, a letter from the previous hearing back in the fall uh, affirming their, their support. Um, so the community councils were notified um, and then the Planning Commission hearing was also notified as, as usual. There were a, a handful of um, attendees at the public hearing, uh, a few spoke in regard to this item. That, 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 that's the extent of the public input. Okay, Council Member Rogers. Um, yeah, I just had a follow-up. Uh, that's a great question that Council Member Johnston had. My question is, how long has this been from start to finish? You know, we've come through this, it's gone through the Planning Commission town. What's the timeline that he's been working on this? This application was submitted in the fall of 2017. Okay. Great. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. So the, the council will be, this is on consent to set the public hearing for July. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, is Derek here? Deech? Okay, uh, Derek, if you want to uh, join us up at the table, um, item number five is a board appointment for the business advisory board. Derek Deech. Derek, thank you for your uh, interest in serving on the business advisory board. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are interested in that board. 
Sure, so my name is Derek Deitch. I work with the Downtown Alliance. Uh, I'm the business development manager, and so part of that, uh, my role is to facilitate business outreach um, in the downtown area. Um, I helped to facilitate the Downtown Merchants Association, um, and I was asked by the Economic Development Department to represent uh, the Downtown Merchants Association and the Downtown Alliance um, and, and the businesses that are located within, the, within that, those boundaries uh, on the Business Advisory Board. Great. Uh, questions uh, or comments? Just comments. I think Derek would be a great addition to that group, uh, especially having kind of this, he works in these two worlds, in the nonprofit world, but also in the business world. So really good input will come from Derek. So I am support this. Great. Appointment. Thank you. And Derek Deitch, um, I need, need to apologize for butchering the Germanic pronunciation of your name. Um, it's so not the first please, time. Please forgive me <laughs> for that. Well, I, but I, I know, and I know better. But so staff, look, so staff in red wrote a, they, they wrote it wrong. I should have, I should have just did it. Hey, well, look, I, I they got it been, from me, so I guess I probably confused that's them. All, it's all it's, it's a so hard one to describe. You are, you are welcome, uh, and, and thank you for your interest in doing this. Your name will be on the, the consent agenda across the hall, um, and so when you, you d you're welcome to stay uh, through the meeting. You don't need to, though. Um, okay. We appreciate your willingness to serve. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And staff knows I love them, and I've been, and I've been you know, <laughs> dishing out a lot of accolades so um, the next item is the Little Cottonwood Canyon environmental impact statement study and John Thomas is the UDOT project manager and then Ralph Becker is the executive director of the Central Wasatch, Wasatch Commission and if you could both join us at the table <coughs> Oh. Sorry, I just plug it into mine. I have so while you're working on that, welcome, um, Mayor. It's good to have you back. And tell us a little bit about about the study. Sure. Maybe while uh, while we're getting set up here, first, it's very nice to see you and to be with you and to be in this fine place. Um, so about a year ago, uh, I took on, it was almost exactly a year ago actually, I took on a position um, with a new governmental entity, the Central Wasatch Commission, which Salt Lake City is uh, a proud participant and, uh, and has contributed in many ways, including financially. <laughs> and the Central Wasatch Commission grew out of Mountain Accord. Uh, among the things that were recommended from Mountain Accord was that a a new governmental entity be established to coordinate uh, the work being done in the <laughs> central Wasatch Mountains, which is basically from Parley's Canyon south uh, through Little Cottonwood Canyon, and then over on the Wasatch back with Summit County and Park City. Um, and, uh, and as part of that, they really had a mission to implement Mountain Accord. Uh, two of the main uh, thrusts of Mountain Accord were to pursue congressional legislation and to solve, or at least help solve, the transportation issues, which uh, reached a breaking point, as we all know, uh, this last winter with the heavy snows and everyone wanted to get up there on powder days for some reason. Um, so um, UDOT, uh, during this same uh, time frame, uh, was uh, received an appropriation uh, from the legislature to uh, make improvements uh, in Little Cottonwood Canyon, among other recreational areas around the state. So I'm going to turn the time over to uh, to John Thomas. Um, you may remember him as the person who led the Solutions to Legacy Parkway, um, but he's uh, been a stellar. Um, uh, solutions-oriented UDOT person for years, and um, he's been assigned uh, the Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS, and it has now kind of morphed into a dual effort with the Central Wasatch Commission. But I'll turn the time over to you, John. Thank you. Chair, Council, my name is John Thomas, Project Manager for UDOT. And <clears throat> today, I'd just like to overview uh, the two activities that we're doing in the Cottonwood Canyons. Um, and 
uh, also answer any questions that you might have as we go on. A little background, um, since 1989, uh, an author sitting next to me did a study um, in the Cottonwood Canyons for the first uh, county general plan and identified some issues associated with the canyons that we're still facing today. Since then, there have been numerous studies trying to understand the different transportation issues and solutions. Um, that has continued uh, to this day. And most recently, the Mountain Accord process um, concluded in 2015 and offered us some um, newer information and insights to uh, transportation solutions. So we're building on all of those efforts. We're not starting from scratch. Those are well-defined, uh, well-understood. And with in 2017, when the legislature approved Senate Bill 277, they did something unique in the country. They asked the Utah Department of Transportation to take $100 million and start to address congestion around recreation areas. And uh, UDOT went through a process that identified 16 areas around the state. The Utah Transportation Commission prioritized four of those for funding, um, one of them being Little Cottonwood Canyon for $66 million. The rest of the money, 15 million, went to St. George to help with a St. George to Springdale transit system to get one uh, up and running there. Um, 10 million went to Moab to help them with some downtown parking. And then Bear Lake got 8.3 million for some roadway improvements, trail improvements, um, some sidewalks, things like that that they've needed up there. So that's, that's how this came about. And so we started um, <clears throat> in 2018, uh, uh, environmental impact statement for Little Cottonwood Canyon. And where we are today with that is we're looking at these issues. And these have been um, discussed in maybe singular issues, um, but we're trying to bring all of these different topics together into one common environmental impact statement to see how they impact transportation. One is avalanche mitigation. Little Cottonwood Canyon is the highest risk for avalanche in the whole um, nation. It's got the highest risk. Um, we had an independent group from Canada come in, help work with our local avalanche crews, both from the ski areas, Forest Service, and UDOT, and they made some findings. And so we're using that in the EIS. Things like berms, berms that would redirect avalanches, um, moving the road onto bridge piers so that the avalanche could come under it. Um, also, more traditionally, snow sheds have been evaluated and looked at. And so we have a pretty good sense of those different alternatives, and we'll be evaluating those in more detail. Wasatch Boulevard from Fort Union Boulevard by the 7-Eleven at the mouth of Big Cottonwood, south towards where it turns off to Lakai or you go up to Little Cottonwood, is um, a section of roadway that we'll be also evaluating in this EIS. And the purpose of that is very different than what we see in the canyon. In the, in, in this area, it goes to the town, city of Cottonwood Heights. Um, it's a, a crucial, um, could be a crucial gateway to both canyons, but it's also a community road. And uh, the folks who live on either side of that have some distinct, serious challenges to getting in and out of their homes. And they also see it as a, uh, this is an opportunity to evaluate how do we make this more of a neighborhood roadway for Cottonwood Heights? And that's gonna be a real challenge because currently right now, it's designated as one of the highest classifications of roads below a freeway just below a freeway. So it serves a pretty high purpose, and because of that, it has a, a 50 mile an hour speed limit, um, other things that you know challenge the neighborhood. And so we'll be looking at some things to help Cottonwood Heights out with that. Transit's a big deal. This is something that we've, um, has been reported in all 16, well not all 16, but many of those studies from 1989. Um, very consistent in reducing the number of vehicles going up the canyon and putting more people and no fewer vehicles. And so that's not a new topic. We have 4,300 spots to park cars at the top of the canyon. We have about 7,000 cars trying to go up the canyons on a busy day. You can imagine what happens. First time Big Cottonwood can first time ever Big Cottonwood Canyon was closed uphill traffic because there was no more parking. There was one lane at the top and for a variety of reasons, that's an unsafe condition. Road had to be closed. So we're trying to address these things. And uh, transit becomes a big part of that. One of the things we're thinking about is, uh, and change from, and this, this is kind of pivotal thinking. Think about the legislature approving 100 million to look at recreation areas. Now in 2019, the legislature approved 13 million for purchase some land at the mouth of Big Cottonwood 
And the purpose of that is a mobility center. What can we do to help transit? And so we're going to go through a process uh, looking, with, looking at the gravel pit area with Cottonwood Heights, the landowner, um, various stakeholders as to what sh could, should that all look like. And it probably isn't just going to be a parking structure. It's probably going to be a transit-oriented development um, with public-private partnership associated with that. Gondola, rail are also part of that. Um, gondolas have been discussed in the past, and you may have heard of those and, and as well. Trailhead parking in the summer. If you've been up White Pine on a Saturday, you probably you might have parked half a mile or more away from the trailhead. Uh, causes some challenges on a 40-mile-an-hour road trying to navigate that. And so what we're trying to look at is how do we take the amount of cars that are parking on the road, put them into a parking lot, and limit, not allow parking on the road anymore. So not increasing parking, but actually we'd be decreasing parking in the canyon with these alternatives. And generally just low cottonwood mobility. We're doing some things looking at the intersection where 209 comes into, or 94 South comes into low cottonwood road. Um, looking at a merge lane in a couple of years to put in there. All it is is a minor fix to help people move a little smoother through that area. This summer we'll be looking at um, constructing some, we call them high T intersections. It's putting a barrier in the middle of the road so as you're coming out of one of the parking lots, you don't have to worry about the downhill can canyon traffic. You can come out into the traffic stream and merge into that. So just some mobility efforts there. That's CIS, and the second one is around um, what we call Transportation Action Plan, Cottonwood Canyon's Transportation Action Plan. And the tolling is um, something that's different on this because we couldn't look at tolling in Little Cottonwood Canyon alone, so we're including both of them. Tolling has the, a very good potential to help achieve the goal of getting fewer vehicles up the canyon and more people in those fewer vehicles. Um, talked about the parking structures, also mobility is the same in both canyons. Um, transit, the things that we look at in Little Cottonwood um, that become applicable. Um, you can imagine gondola as an alternative could be identified in Little Cottonwood, but what if it made sense to at least evaluate it going over into Big Cottonwood? What would that process be? We, we would do it in this transportation action plan. Also, it, you, Set of that question, I mean, I know that <clears throat> one of the concerns about that is the concern that we had initially with the expansion of the ski resorts. Um, what would that do to, uh, I mean, especially if we're talking about, um, you know, the connection between the two canyons, what does that do potentially to the watershed? And, and, and so those impacts definitely need to be addressed. One of the things we're trying to understand is, do those, what are, what are the benefits of something like that? Do If we have travel in between the canyons that we could now take off of the road in one canyon and put it on a gondola that has three times the capacity of our road, what are the trade-offs? So, so it would be a, a, a gondola, not a, not a, you wouldn't be putting a road in between the two canyons. We're not looking at a road between the two canyons, but okay. a gondola <clears throat> okay. might be if that's something we get to okay. um, as part of what our... About, what about guardsmen? To, is there also discussion about paving guardsmen and having that as year-round access? Not at this point. Okay, good. So, and I'll just note that in Mount, during the Mountain Accord process, guardsmen was looked at. It was... Rejected. Okay. Um, I just it, want. I, it, yeah. I. I. I am happy to hear that. I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't. Uh, just in this. this. In the simplest way, Park City and Summit <laughs> County viewed it as completely unacceptable. Okay. Uh, you can imagine going down Sweet Alley um, with the volume of cars that would be coming through. Okay, Councilmember Wharton. So the uh, the gondola option. That's how is that different than Ski Link? So. This, this would be in Little Cottonwood Canyon running somewhere from the base of Little, could be down at 94th and Highland where UT has a big park and ride lot. We don't know that right now. We do know that any base is a significant impact and we need to evaluate. That's part of the evaluation. So it's run Little Cottonwood Canyon. We may evaluate it going over into big because there may be a benefit of having that capacity um, in a gondola versus in Big Cottonwood Canyon Road. So th there are trade-offs that we need to evaluate. But is, the, is this the same thing that was like envisioned by Ski Link or is this different? Very different. Uh, I, I, I'm not too familiar with Ski Link, but it came from the other side into yeah. Solitude where th 
I think looking more towards little to big. Yeah, one of the other outcomes of Mountain Accord was um, it, um, it's the agreement called for no expansion of ski areas with a few minor exceptions. It also said that in terms of connecting Big and Little Cottonwood Canyon, um, that chairlifts, in other words, ski area expansion, would not be considered. Transportation systems could be. So if a gondola was used purely for transportation, it could be considered, but not as a way to provide additional skiing. Okay. Would the, would the gondola be, sorry, are you done? Well, just that you were saying that the, the plan would be to bring people from Little Cottonwood into Big Cottonwood, but I mean, obviously it would run back and forth. So it, so in that regard, it would be similar, but it would be mostly as a transit thing, not as a moving skiers back and forth. Is that right? There, yeah, I think somebody explained it to me saying the gondola would not stop at the top of the ridge line to let skiers off. Uh -huh. It would go from ski area to ski area base, base to base, to oh. just move people between oh, the I ski see. areas. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Does that, does that help? Yes. And potentially, and, and you would have other stops at trailheads along the way up the canyon. That's part of the, that'll okay. be part of the alternative development because it, it, it's a challenge to make a stop. How do you go up and down and yeah. all that? So. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments before? Okay. okay. So the schedule that we're um, looking at for both of these, um, we're just starting the process, uh, going through the different steps, and we see um, significant um, point when we come up with the um, draft alternatives uh, about a year from now. And I think between now and that year time frame, we'll be doing a lot of outreach with a variety of different stakeholder groups, um, updating uh, councils like yourselves, if you'd like, and uh, preparing for um, the final EIS, which would then uh, further study a range of alternatives associated with that. And will you also be um, working with Salt Lake City Public Utilities um, on, on some of these issues, just so that you know, we can have a lot of the watershed um, questions answered? Salt Lake City Public Utilities is very involved with us. Okay. They are the highest um, qualified agency designation in the EIS, so they have a lot of responsibility to this okay. process. Yes. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, Ralph. Yeah, I might say that um, you brought up public utilities and watershed, and obviously for some of us that's a, a top priority, and I think people recognize that across the valley and really everybody involved with the, with the West Hatch Mountains. Um, they have been uh, a, I'd say, a critical player all the way through, not just during the Mountain Accord days, but all the way through with the Central Wasatch Commission. Um, and uh, in virtually every meeting where we are discussing anything, uh, Laura Briefer, Carly Castle, and others are part of those discussions. Um, and they are playing, a, uh, I'd say, a prominent role. Um, they wrote very detailed comments, both on the Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS during the scoping process and on the Cottonwood Canyons Transportation Action Plan. So uh, they are, um, as John said, pretty much at the forefront, at the table, in terms of what may happen up there. Uh, they also have played a huge role, um, I'd say, in assisting the commission from a staffing point of view and, um, and are playing a very large role in the congressional legislation and in the development of that congressional legislation. All right. Um, so thank you for that. And, and I'll just, I just want to tell you that, you know, when you were hired on um, in that position, that's one of the, that is one of the watershed issue is one of the things that I was really concerned about, especially with the creation of a new <clears throat> governmental entity. Um, your staffing uh, that position has, has made me feel much, much um, better about my watershed concerns. So I just want to share that with you and thank you for that. Thank you for being there. Uh, Councilmember Johnston. I, I have a question that may, I'm going to try and formulate it better. It's about metrics, essentially outcome goals. And is there a sense of what the destination is here? I, I mean, there's a lot of ideas about more people, fewer cars or vehicles up the canyons. Um, it sounds like trying to maximize exposure for 
for the public and minimize environmental impact might be one way to put it. But are there, are you to the point of defined metrics right now? Because everything I've read says you're in the middle of it, perhaps a uh, goal and needs assessment right now. Is there a sense of that, like the detail level of that? We'll be getting that into, um, we had a meeting this morning actually trying to start to frame that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very early on, but one of the things for example, what we talked about this morning was, how do you compare gondola, train, bus, private auto, and the associated impacts with that? And so one of the things we're trying to understand is, is what is going up there now, mm -hmm. and how many people does that equate to? Because we've done studies to understand how many people are in the cars. It's about one in three is a private, is a single occupant vehicle. Um, and in that, we're trying to address, should it be travel time comparisons bet between those different modes? Should it be throughput, how many people go through? Um, so we're not there at that, at that, we don't know for sure what those metrics are, but we're, those are a couple of areas we're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Because imagine with um, these transit hubs, and we have one at the gravel pit, one at 94th and Highland, and we go to just one stop at Snowbird on the highway in a transit center, has lockers, restrooms, heated space, one at Snowbird, one at Alta, one at Solitude, one at Brighton, and we've had preliminary discussions on that. We can get a very efficient five-minute headway of buses, and we go from carrying 500 people a day going up Little Cottonwood Canyon to 5,000 people. And so we're trying to understand how do you measure the differences between those in trying to make those metrics. That's my question, I guess, is that it sounds like there's an idea of how to maximize exposure to the canyons with the smallest environmental footprint. At some point, though, 5,000 moves to 10,000 people on five to 10 trailheads in the summer or two ski resorts in the wintertime. Um, is there a sense of a threshold at this point? That's a, that's a, a, a question that gets asked a lot. Um, what, what is the maximum um, uh, use of forest, public forest lands um, there with a variety of jurisdictions having some role in that discussion, um, including NGOs? Um, so it's, it's, it's to be determined, but I think what, I think the takeaway we're going on right now is from 1989 to now we've got numerous studies that point to the same things over and over again. We're not reinventing the wheel. We see some things that we can maybe help with. We're not going to solve the problem by any stretch, but we can help some things and what are reasonable things to do to address that. Okay. And so are we going to fix it? Are we going to create? something completely different than today? I don't think so. Okay, so that's more, more the scope. What's reasonable, what we can accomplish in the short term and some or medium short term. So I might just add, as part of the Central Wasatch Commission's work, um, we are developing an environmental dashboard, uh, and then that's going to be transformed into an interactive online tool uh, called a hub. And what we're doing is we are collecting all of the various information and analyses and then having peer review so that everyone is working from a common basis of information and so that impacts can be analyzed much easier and much better. Uh, so that what you're raising, it, you know, about, you know, how, how do we deal with this crush of people? I mean, there are more visitors to this part of these mountains than all the national parks in Utah combined. This is a small area. It is remarkable that the watersheds have been able to be maintained and that the quality of experiences have been able to maintain. And I think the challenge um, that the Central Wasatch Commission is focused on and includes in its participation in these transportation, in this transportation work is how do we, how do we preserve the quality of the environment up there, especially the watersheds? How do we also preserve the quality of the experiences for different users seeking different kinds of experiences? And we've got a lot to learn. There's been a lot of studies like that. Um, and they, they can be a quagmire, but they can also really lend a lot of good information for decision making. So okay. we're, we're working in that realm as well. That's you know, running in a parallel way with, a, with the transportation work. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mendenhall. 
John and Ralph, thanks for being here. My question's about the parking structure evaluation, and, and I, I'm trying to follow along with the packet we have, and I'm not, yeah, sorry, they don't look the same, so I'm not sure if you've already passed that part, but talk to us about the, the fees associated. Who will be getting the revenue from these parking structures? I'm assuming they will not be free but tell me if they will. And then how do we, if the, um, I, I see the pictures of the existing private parking potential. I know that there's UTA lot there and talk to us about whether or not UTA is looking at implementing a fee and then what kind of guarantees we have that that revenue will serve the service in the canyon. Okay. So I think there's a variety of ways that the, parking fees can be addressed. One is to have a straight fee for you go into a garage, you pay a fee. We're working with Cottonwood Heights on, can we do a transit-oriented development to where the developer has some role in that, in operating and maintaining that? We'll also be creating a revenue stream, potentially, if we do tolling. And the tolling could help offset the transit use and parking. But these decisions have yet to still need to be made. We still haven't generated, we're doing a traffic, uh, excuse me, a tolling revenue study. Uh, we just started it, will be done by the end of this year to help us better estimate, you know, what is the willingness of people to pay a toll Can, and how much is that? Let me pause you there. The, I understand how a toll to enter the fee or enter the canyon could be tied in the control of the Central Wasatch Commission maybe or in the agreements you make to the service in the canyon, but the private parking lots and even the UTA parking lot, what kind of negotiation ability do you have for those fees that could be those private property owners could render? So I don't think we're, we're not looking at any private parking lots. We're looking at state developed ones that would have some kind of pro forma that would support the A best outcome. private partnership. Yes, that but, would support the best behavior shift to transit and that's what we're that's ever that's the levers we're trying to use here is to get more people in transit so that mm -hmm. of those 7,000 cars with three people per car that's 21,000 people 5,000 of them are on a bus that would be success how do we get to that and we don't know if we can but free parking free transit those things all need to be discussed along with the tolling revenue to see how that all gets paid for and I think you're aware that of the some of the state funding that's going toward that regionally significant transportation development at Big Cottonwood Canyon, the majority of that grant fund is coming or is directed to come toward Block 67 here in Salt Lake City. So, uh, and that's a parking structure development that you don't have to know about, but oh, yeah. what the we're in a similar uh, conversation in terms of uh, oh, state-funded parking structure that's really privately the, developed okay. and operated. And the reality is that in, in our experience so far, we don't have any lever on how much that developer is going to charge to operate and for admittance to that parking structure. So I think this, like the public-private partnership, it makes sense in a lot of ways. I think ultimately we don't have any teeth in what it's going to cost to park and I think it's a conversation but it doesn't seem like a contractual conversation looks like we have a lot to learn still <laughs> and I'll look forward to learning with you thanks thank you okay well thank you both um, oh, go ahead Ralph thank you, mr. chairman if I might um, so Salt Lake City has been a great supporter and participant all the way from the beginning in this back in 2012 um, and uh, Congressman Curtis has committed to, uh, to lead the congressional legislation. Um, he has asked uh, that each of the jurisdictions uh, take some formal action to express their support for the work of the Central Wasatch Commission. So I'd, I'd ask that maybe you consider taking that up sometime in the next couple of months. And so what's, what's his time frame on that? Uh, I don't think we'll see legislation introduced for a few months. So okay. there's, there's time. But uh, there's been enough controversy, as you know, around what may happen or should happen in the mountains and about a new designation and additional protections in these mountains. And uh, Congressman Curtis is looking for uh, support from each of the jurisdictions that he can carry with him as he runs legislation. 
Okay. So if you, I mean, if you have, you know, some draft um, Happy to get you recommendations or things like that, just get them to um, council staff and we'll. And the last two weeks, um, Sandy City and uh, Mill Creek have both okay. passed yeah, resolutions and the other jurisdictions <coughs> are kind of in progress. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, get us that and then um, we'll, I'll, I'll make sure that we get it on the agenda um, this summer or fall. Appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, we are now ready to go back to the budget. We have the two ordinances in front of us right now. We have the um, regular Salt Lake City budget ordinance and then the RDA ordinance as well. Um, typically, we don't do RDA. Uh, we don't handle RDA issues in the council, but because these um, ordinances are, are so close, um, a lot of the changes are, are parallel. So. Um, you know, Chair uh, Fowler, if you're okay with us going through that, we'll, we'll do that right now. Um, once we get it up on the board, Jennifer, are you going to walk us through that or is Lehua going to walk us through it or? It, it looks like maybe, so this is, this is the live processing of the city budget. Isn't this exciting? It looks like the attorney's office might have some thoughts. So maybe i'll look to like who maybe we need to do we should we take a break and then come See, and this back? Is, and this is why we call this the work session because we're literally <laughs> we're work working session. on yeah <laughs> getting this done so perfect thank you <laughs> okay let me just bring them up and we've passed these out to council members yep. um so i just want to make sure i am bringing up the correct versions and then um, Lynn Pace may pop up with a couple of changes because he's also just getting these. Um. Can you ask hey, him? Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so diligent. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, so um, if everyone, sorry. Salt Lake City budget ordinance right now. Thank you. Um, and I'll just go through all of the changes that we've made since Thank the you. item was placed in your red folders today. Um, at the top and, of- And council, if, you have, if anyone has any questions or additions as we're going through this. Uh, yeah, don't wait until the end. Once we, once we reach that, we'll no. work on it right when we get to it. Perfect. Um, at the top of page three in the bottom of the section regarding the police department, we added language to say, and encouraging the administration to include those positions within the bike squad. Um, under the next item, public utilities department, we added the words um, and address health hazards. Um, then down on page four in the middle, beginning with item three, sub item A, uh, the, we added language there to just be clear that the council intends to continue its in-depth policy discussion surrounding all aspects of housing. Um, sorry, I'll stop saying. On the next page five under I, sub item B, transfer to RDA. And this portion, uh, Lynn may have a suggestion to be clear that the trial basis is to reflect that this isn't a permanent decision for forever. Um, that this is. This may, a, not, this may not be a permanent may decision. May not be. Okay. That it is just to move the funds at this time to RDA with consideration later for where the best place is. And Lynn might have some better language to suggest. Right, just because I think the language you've got here on a trial basis will make everyone wonder, made me wonder, how long is your trial basis? Is it three months? Is it So if your trial basis is intended to be for the budget year, then I think you could say transferred on a trial basis for this budget year or something like that. Um, because otherwise I think it'll be, it, it, will, it will put into question how long you intend to have those funds there. So does the council support just adding to the end of this phrase for the current budget year? Okay. 
then if I can just add, Mr. Chair, sure. you, looking down in several other places you have on a trial basis, you might consider changing that for the current budget year, right? So it's just so it's clear what time period you're talking about. So. Okay, is everyone clear on that? All right. I'll we'll be here on two. Okay. Okay. And then in that next item in the middle of the page, um, item two. On so page six or page five. five still? Okay. Still page five. On a trial basis in the current budget year, the council intends to establish a housing development trust fund within the redevelopment agency of Salt Lake City and to evaluate further codifying the consolidation of housing development programs by ordinance. To confirm that all of the city's housing development loan funds, regardless of funding source and regardless of which entity administered the program, are deployed in a transparent manner. And we may administer the program instead of administered. Um, then in the next sentence, adding July 29th to be clear, or 2019 to be clear about the timing. And at the end of that clause, also adding regardless of the entity administering the fund. And then item three there. Just before you go on, I'm sorry to interrupt again, Mr. Chairman. I'm assuming that the insertion of the July 2019 date is to capture, is to identify how an application should be processed if that application comes in before you adopt this other housing ordinance. Yes. Correct. If you're really, really confident you're gonna adopt that in July, then you're okay, but this would cover all of July, regardless of whether or not you adopt the ordinance. And if you don't get adopted by July 31st, it wouldn't cover August. So what you might wanna do is change it to say, it's the council's intent that any application that comes to Salt Lake City before the council's adoption of the housing ordinance be processed this way. Okay. Sense. I think it does make sense. I'm still confident we'll get it done in July, but I that think, I, but I, I think that's, that's a good safe catch. Okay. So. Okay, perfect, thanks, Lynn. And then item number three there is the newly drafted language. Okay, so. <clears throat> so it just reads, the council expresses its intent to evaluate the approach after both six months and one year to determine whether it is functioning in a matter that maximizes the positive community impact of the city's housing development investment. It is further the intent of the council that the city's housing program funds will continue to be funded and managed in the Department of Community and Neighborhoods Housing and Neighborhood Development Division. Okay, and then um, the point of section four was to um, address any budget contingencies that were related to other parts or the whole funding our future funding. And so my suggestion is to remove this first item A, the council approval of the downtown payment assistance program details prior to funding availability. And that's also covered in the fact that those funds have been put into a holding account but we can leave it here as well. It's just an additional approach Thoughts? To, to remove this or to leave it. If, it I, if it's cleaner to remove it, remove it. And then that's it for the, the ordinance, adopting the city budget. And if I could just refer you to the RDA um, agenda or resolution as well um, that had sections related to the housing funding and the transfer to RDA and so we've gone through and added all of these pieces to this section as well it refers to a trial basis we'll add for the so what we'll what we'll want to do um, if if everyone's okay with this rather than walking through the language that Lynn just mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're gonna have to change that here because you know, it says here that it's the council's intent that July 2019. So any, any changes that we just made um, yeah. in that, if we can make those in this, um, and then do any of you have any other thoughts on these? Okay, so we can do, you don't need to do that. Perfect. Right. I mean, you need to do it now because we're going to do <laughs> just it. Just not here. Yeah, just not table. right now. <laughs> yeah. But in, within 30 minutes, we have to have it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Any other uh, issues or concerns on these two ordinances and the resolution? What a good thing. All right. Okay. I want to, um, before we break, I just want to thank... Um, 
all of my council colleagues for your help during this budget process. This has been um, in the, this is my eighth budget and this is the toughest budget that we've had. Um, and so I just wanna thank all of you for um, your um, hard work and long hours that you've put into this. Um, and now I really, really wanna thank staff because as always, um, they, there is no way that we could have gone through and, and you know, made the, the changes and adjustments without the, the quality staff that we have. And for those of you who are lucky enough to watch um, as we've gone through this, it seems messy, um, but it really, it really is not. You know, we've, what we've been able to do today, the, the stuff that seems to be you know, being done on the fly, um, is not there is so much um, you know institutional knowledge with the staff and I just want to thank all of them for uh, the the time effort uh, energy I know that many of us have texted at you know crazy crazy late hours um, and staff are up working on this so um, we couldn't have done it without you thank you um, and let's, let's uh, take a break uh, for dinner and then we'll reconvene across the hall for the formal meeting at seven o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.